Division S. It is play day number two, ladies. And we have Pepe, my lady, against Crystal Gaming. Crystal Gaming is the organization that Kiko Combo teamed up with. So after the team dominated the qualifiers and made it into Division S, Kiko Combo was also extremely successful on their first play day and was able to secure themselves a 3-0 victory and then got picked up by Crystal Gaming. So congratulations to them. From here on out, they will go through the season as Crystal Gaming. And it should actually be a pretty awesome series because it's interesting to see how far Crystal Gaming can go there. Now, of course, keep in mind that the two teams faced off against each other already a few times in the qualifiers. Both are new to Division S. And Crystal Gaming goes into this as a bit of a favorite, I would say. But just given the standings in the rankings right now, I would say that Crystal Gaming has a bit of a shot to not only establish themselves in the upper part of the of the ranking, but also maybe start to attack the top teams a little bit. So it's an interesting team for sure, and we'll see how far they can actually go with this. A little bit of a shout out first of all, before all of this is happening. So guys, uh, if you wanna have a look at the live stream schedule, you can go over to kaldor.tv and check that out. Always keep that in mind, kaldor.tv, if you wanna have a few more updates and also an idea of which tournaments, which leagues, which matches are coming up next, you can always have a look there. Also, a little bit of housekeeping here. Some people have already asked me, hey, where exactly on YouTube are the uh, spoiler protection, for example. Unfortunately, it turned out that pretty much no one with very, very few exceptions actually started to pour, so, support channel after I said that I'm going to, that the spoiler protection actually hurts the channel quite a bit. So uh, since the ad revenue started to tank extremely on YouTube, I have now put this, connected this together with a Patre Patreon milestone. So if you guys are interested to support my work in Heroes and Esports in general, you can head over to patreon.com slash caldo and check it out over there. And then eventually at some point we can bring that back. But for now, spoiler protection on YouTube is actually off simply had too much of a negative impact not only on the views and everything else because of the dead space but also just ads in general and since i monitored this over the last few months it was pretty transparent when it started to kick in so it's been unfortunate but at this point there's just no other way to uh, reliably handle this but let's focus a little bit on the game at hand. We are already used to the bans on Deathwing. And Oriel being banned out is honestly something that we're going to see probably a bit more now too. Because she just combos too well with too many heroes that you don't want to go up against. We've seen a lot of Cho'Gal being brought back. Most of them in a little bit more of a Mimi setup outside of Division S North America where the hero was played a bit more just in general. But together with Aureal and her new Resurrect ability or the Change Resurrect ability, she's of course powerful there. Combos very well with Vala and a few others too, so she gets eliminated. We have for Cursed Hollow some global value for the Polish team, Pepe My Lady, dropping Dehaka into the mix here. Whereas X here is playing Lucio. And I can't fault that guy when he plays any kind of support. He is an absolute beast there. His Brightwing is highly impactful. His Lucio so far has done wonders too. So he gets a pass from me whenever he picks any of those heroes. We have ETC played by them as well, which gives them now flexibility on the Horik. He'd go into stage dive to counteract Dehaka a little bit. Even the Butcher ban is now coming through. <laughs> So they banned Zeratul, they banned Abatha, and they banned the Butcher now. So a bit more of a targeted ban, I would assume, or they're just straight up trolling. But Arthas has also been taken out. Which is interesting when you think about it for just a second, because if you see Greyman on the other side, you would assume that Arthas gets banned by Crystal Gaming. Maybe that's what initiated the ban against the Butcher there, I'm not quite sure. But Arthas is not your traditional ban. There's of course a couple of preference picks on the two teams that have now played a lot against each other that they know of, and that could have triggered some of those picks and bans. But now we have Johanna coming through, Li Ming is also taken, so that's a little bit more on the normal setup. Falstad, still a hero that could be played, we've seen him a lot more lately, and of course around the bosses with a Mighty Gust, he has pretty much a big impact. Oh, but there's Maya first of all. Okay, Maya with that little setup, and we see Blaze coming in. Very melee heavy from them. Greymane the only range damage and even he wants to go into Worgen form. There's a lot of stuns and CC available for Crystal Gaming. Not quite as meme as we've seen them in some of the recent matches with the Probius first pick for example that they opened up with in their first series and played in number one. But here and played in number two as they're trying to solidify their lead in the standings. They haven't dropped the map yet. 
We'll see what they can do here. Sylvanas gets taken by Paper My Lady, and that sets us up for game number one, everybody. Curse Tolo is the map. Paper My Lady against Crystal Gaming. Best of five series in Division as Europe. So let's head straight in for the first map in the series. Game number one, Curse Tolo, Pepe, my lady, on the left side, the Polish team with the will queue on Johanna, Richu on Dehaka. We're currently looking at Dyla on Rega, Sesabos on Liming, and Gore Rider on Sylvanas. Over to the right side of the map, the newly formed Crystal Gaming. Well, not newly formed. I mean, they were f around formerly as Kiko Combo, now joining up with Crystal Gaming. The team with Kolios on MyF, Ixi on Lucio, Slade on Blaze. We have Skewubi on ETC, and Yazu is playing Greyman. All right, game on. Already on level one, the Aether Walk taken by Liming here as they're making their plays. And what else are we going to get? I mean, first of all, we have Globe Talents for Blaze and for ETC on level 1. And also, for Rega, the Wolf Run. So, yeah, big skirmish in the middle. The Harker isn't there. There's the Tether, there's the Stun, the follow-up. First one. And Rega is down. Super quick kill here. And this is exactly highlighting all those CC chains that I talked about in the draft. So they lock down on the target, they get one slide after another through, they have the stun follow-ups. Now even a bit of damage against Johanna as she's trying to rotate down to the bottom of the map to go up against Kolios here. And Greymane has moved towards the top side. So heavily aggressive game already from Crystal Gaming. And it's a style that we've seen from them throughout the qualifiers. As I mentioned during the last match that they played, they have been absolutely incredible in the qualifiers. They were the team that qualified for the second season of Division S first from all the teams that had to qualify. Other teams like Washed Up or Lobas Fan Club obviously didn't even have to go through the qualifiers since they were already qualified through season number one. But it was pretty impressive to see uh, Kiko Gaming, aka Crystal Gaming, to do it so well. And now they have to prove that here. The Haka is actually double checking what's happening over there on the opponent's side of the night camp, but there's nobody here. Instead, we're seeing a bit of a push into the middle, but Johanna gets booped into tower range by X here. And Greyman has now, a bit later than expected from Pepe My Lady, started to go for the night camp. So he's moving in for that. Down to the bottom of the map. A bit of aggression against the Will Q, but not of any consequence yet. At least for now, Colius couldn't do anything here. Lucio trying to annoy the opponent a bit as they are attempting to take their own camp, sliding around, actually forcing Johanna off the bot lane to help out a bit too. Ixir, still fine for now, zooms out, and that's three heroes that now commit their time and resources to this. Even an interrupt against the Hearthstone here. Ixir just doing his best to piss the opponent off, and I would say so far he succeeded with that. Level 4, Orb Talent for Liming, as we went over a few times after Dominance got nerfed by Blizzard. It's still a viable pick on level 4, but we see Triumph Ray taken a lot more often now. Bit of aggression in the mid lane again, as the two uh, camps collide. Sylvanas, of course, doing her best to mitigate the power of the push from Crystal Gaming. But there we go, with another approach on two potential kill onto those gates. First Tribute is, by the way, spawning now as well, so that's something to focus on. On level 4, we also see Eternal Retaliation now, so the cooldown reduction in this case. And in comes Blaze. They're trying for another kill. They're making the slide happen, but Gore Rider zips onto the wave, and Sylvanas therefore escapes unharmed for now. A quick drag attempt from the Haka, but the fight isn't over yet. Li Ming, on the other hand, she's on the channel, and that's an easy one. Absolute freebie for the team in blue. Paper My Lady with a slight advantage on the objective now. Still a slight stats advantage and also advantage over here on the experience for their opponent, Crystal Gaming. After the initial kill, weren't really able to get another one set up, but they're doing their best here to put the pressure onto Sylvanas as she attempts to push the lanes out. In the mid lane, the supports are going off against each other, and Ixia again is just out there. I mean, he is always hyper aggressive, and he needs to be careful that that doesn't turn against him. In this case, he barely escapes as three heroes are attempting to lock him down. Unsuccessfully, I might add. With level 7 talents around and the second tribute spawning, we also see, of course, Calamity coming through for Liming. In addition to that, the hammer on for ETC. I don't see that all that often, but Gore Rider down! This time, unexpected to him. We have the killers, Greyman goes straight in and rips Sylvanas' throat out. 
So a second kill for the red team, and that gives them a tribute, for sure. There's not going to be any kind of moves from Pepe my lady in order to interrupt that. Maybe if, yeah, the flashlight didn't even do anything. So, therefore, Will Q has to be healed, even getting the healing totem out there. It's not really anything of consequence just yet, but it already indicates a bit that we have one team just heavily uh, rotating on the map, being hyper-aggressive. Crystal Gaming is trying to do their best in order to lock the opponent down. And Ixia, honestly, when you just follow this guy, at some point you are going to have an epileptic seizure. This guy, I don't know what he eats for breakfast, but it feels like he drinks 50 energy drinks per day. He's definitely hyped up, I can tell you that much. He's just zipping around on Lucio like he's on drugs, it's crazy. So, in this case, they're actually jumping on the next target, and the will queue is caught very much alone. Nice iron skin, though, but I don't think it's going to save him. They're just homing in on him with four heroes, and there is just no escape. Three kills against zero now. Top lane gets pressured, though, and that's where Sylvanas is adding additional damage with her disabling all the turrets, but the rotation is in. And Lucy is, of course, great for this right now. And they're going for another kill against the doggy. Dyla in trouble, and he gets dropped. Nicely done. Yeah, these rotations are nasty. And with four kills against zero and an early level 10, third tribute is definitely going to be picked up by Crystal Gaming. And they have it immediately here. Okay. So right now, stage dive, as already expected, to counteract the Haka a little bit. Nice attempt to take Slate down, but the body blocks weren't good enough, and Richard didn't have the tongue ready uh, again. Ixias is again, just going out to the top and annoys people. The drag was nowhere near Lucio, and they're making the play for Sylvanas, and all of a sudden, she's down. Everything's set up by Lucio. They go down to the bottom of the map, where Li Ming is now dead too. A bit of a body block attempt. Dyla goes in with the last bite, and at least takes Greymane down. Just showing dominance here in the wolf pack and ripping the big bad wolf apart. Six kills against one, Wizen Duelist on level seven for Greymane, and in comes X. the guy is everywhere. And even the level 10 that just dropped into their hands couldn't save the doggy anymore. So that's another kill, seven against one now, favorable position for Crystal Gaming, and a great spot here for them too, as the next tribute spawns on the right side of the map. Level 10 abilities, no big surprises here. Generally speaking, we still have the Warden's Cage. We talked already a bit about Stage Dive as a countermeasure to Dehaka's global and go for the Throat for Greymane. But absolute perfect play here from Crystal Gaming so far. And I gotta say, Ixia again absolutely delivering on Lucio. The team is just setting up, making sure that nobody gets even close to the tribute point. I mean, look how much they are buying themselves time here. But Dehaka globals in, and that's the only play that they could make in order to get this close to him. Uh, there's the fight there for. Blaze is coming in from the top, trying to lock them down here. And everybody is just centering around the fight again as Liming is just shelling away from the back line, getting one combo after another through. Another channel attempt from Yasuo and Greymane as they're trying to get close enough, and it's going to be tricky for Paper My Lady to do anything about it. There's the curse already against the blue team. Have to start to move onto the lanes again, the red team that is. But they have a huge opportunity now to get even farther ahead in the game. And at the top, Structures are already falling and Greyman is on the way. Lucio is interrupting rotation attempts and slowing them down a bit as the rest of the red team is defending in the mid lane against the night camp that was previously taken. Kolios dodging out on the damage. There's the blessed shield and he goes down. Nicely done on the side of Pepe My Lady. Especially Dehaka's ult did of course a lot here. Gorida might be in trouble and yeah, well, you can call that trouble because he's dead. Easy solo kill from Yasu, gets the cocktail through to take down the minion wave. The fort is annihilated, ETC is sitting in the mid lane, pretty much doing the same thing. And <laughs> Ixia is playing 1v4. He's <laughs> once again just rushing around on the map. Greyman is already working at the top keep wall, whereas in the mid lane the fort is being destroyed. I was nearly able to take one of the towers down. 14 against 13 any seconds, but yeah, it's boss time. Of course it's boss time, but that's what you're gonna go for. So plays are being made all over the place, and right now 15,000 damage from Ixia against the 15,000 that we see for Greymane, so pretty much top damage for him. Obviously helped by the fact that he's just rotating in and out the entire time and starts to poke against them. And he sees exactly what's happening here. And he's gonna try. <laughs> I'm really curious to see what we're gonna have from him. Okay, comes in, starts to annoy them a little bit. Guys, the rotation is underway. 
ETC with a stage dive. They want it. They want the boss and they are easily able to steal it, aren't they? They're moving in, so does the will queue. The uh, Ancestral is out to keep Gore Rider alive, but there's the cage against the doggy. Liming is down. Rega follows and they go for the point with the kill against Johanna. The will queue dead, the boss stolen. The other one is already pushing through the top lane, going in straight for the keep itself. And at the bottom of the map, they can now make another play. Whereas the Haka is in so much trouble. Ixir speeding them up, moves in, boops the Haka back, and there's no fort any longer. Greyman is just ripping him apart with one attack after another. The Haka down 16 against 14 in terms of levels 12, kills against two. Bottom fort annihilated. Top lane Sylvanas defending, but the gate is down. So are the two towers. The boss finally defeated but everybody else is homing in towards the bottom of the map to try and put pressure onto the keep itself. Crystal Gaming once again starting off quite dominant here and they are definitely aiming for the top in this second season of Division S. It's going to be super interesting to see them go up against some of the other teams that were already present in Division S last season during Season 1 because right now it feels like the rest of the competition is just cannon fodder to them. At least when we're looking at game number one. Of course, it's only the first map of a best of five series, but at least thus far, it's a great match for them. In they go again, trying to maybe get a little more. The question is how far can they go here? They took the keep down and they decide to actually move back. All right. No big risks here. They have the level 16 talents. Right now, looking at the damage output, we have 25,000. And oh my god, what the hell did Liming take? Liming? I didn't even see that. Glass cannon? Against Greymain and ETC with a stage dive? Mayev for the jump in? And the way that he's playing on Lucio? I mean, good luck keeping yourself alive against this setup. Massive mistake, in my opinion. I mean, this is really just YOLOing it. If they feel so desperate that they need the extra damage in order to, s to set a kill up for themselves, by all means, but I think this is a huge mistake. That's going to be exploited by Crystal Gaming in nearly every fight now. That is, that is a horrible talent to be taken on that level. So once that Crystal Gaming picks up on that, they're going to focus on Li Ming whenever they can in every single fight here. Didn't even see that so far. Explains also why in the last one she died extremely quickly. But Greymane can of course just murder her right now. Yeah, Li Ming so far has died two times. There's the attack again as they're moving through the mid lane. Another tribute is spawning. This is, by the way, would be the second tribute for whichever team takes it. Yeah, and so far they're just dodging out the combos on Li Ming. Making sure that nothing else is happening here, but not a fan of that choice. Level 16 is in on both sides now, so that's an even talent fight for Paper My Lady. They will have, find have a tough time to get a better setup than this. Li Ming's combos are getting dodged out so far, but a good setup. Is all that she needs, maybe here. ETC comes in and the Ancestral is through. The Haka comes in from behind, gets immediately booped away. The rest of the team is engaging from the other side. The drag doesn't connect and therefore he doesn't get the tongue through. The big stun and Sylvanas is dead instantly. Has no chance and Greyman is of course ripping Li Ming a new one. Glass cannon against this Greyman, just forget about it. Four heroes down, the Haka the only one to escape, and now they're cutting off his path of retreat as well. 16 kills against two. The Haka's death is an, 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 an inevitability. And here we go. Another one down, they don't go for the core, but instead they apparently make the play for the remaining keeps. We have two heroes focusing on the top lane, and they could easily core this. I'm actually a little bit surprised that they are bothering with the keeps. Yes, yeah, Sylvanas is back in another 5 seconds, but initially they had 5 left in order to make the play here. Of course, this is going to be fairly safe to have 2 keeps down, grab level 20, maybe take a boss. That's a cooldown on the boss. Another 37 seconds should be an easy grab for them, especially with another curse that they're putting on now. Top keep, uh, it's most likely not going to fall with the defense, but it's something that they could have done. Right now, 27,000 damage for Sylvanas, that's just not nearly enough to make any, have any hope for them. 35,000 for Greymane, the channel is soon gonna come through and then they can set up the curse here and maybe even push for victory. They're already trying to set something up against the will queue. 
Yeah, Iron Skin not used yet. He needs to hold that back a little bit. The Haka is there and might be forced to use the Ancestral once it's back from cooldown. There's the level 20 talents now that they have. As the fight continues, and the crowd pleaser. Big stage dive from ETC. They're making the play here again. Lee Ming is just continuously on the run here, trying to get away from the damage dealers. But Sylvanas is already dead, and they're just chasing them into oblivion. Ancestral keeps Rega alive, but that also means that we're likely going to see the death of... Well, not even Johanna. Rega dies regardless. Johanna also falls. So do the shields on the core. And this is the lead in this Best of Five series in Division S Season 2 for Crystal Gaming, formerly known as Kiko Combo, as they take down Pepe My Lady on Cursed Hollow. GG, and well played. Game number one, a little bit of a beating here that Paper My Lady just received. Crystal Gaming definitely off to a good start. And to just put this in perspective again, the two teams, as I mentioned, as we headed into game one, obviously met multiple times during the qualifiers for season two. And Crystal Gaming, aka Kiko Combo, were incredibly dominant there. So it's not really a surprise that the red team is currently looking quite powerful here. Also, they won their first match with a 3-0, whereas Pepe My Lady had the bad luck, you could say, to go up against Washed Up straight away. Washed Up, the winners, the champions of Season 1. So Pepe My Lady didn't win a single map there, which means that right now they are 0-4 in the map score, as this is their second match. This is Play Day 2. So it will be tricky. They will end up at the bottom of the standings if they can't at least win a map here. Brightwing gets banned, and that might be a bit of a surprise to a lot of people. But I tell you, I'm not a Brightwing fan, as you might have heard in the past already. There's rumors that I'm not really the biggest Brightwing fan. Outside of Brightwing being played on a very high level, and Ixia is playing a fantastic Brightwing and is murdering people. Probably glimpsed, uh, a glim got a glimpse of that already last week, but now we have Brightwing banned out against him. Deathwing gets banned out too. And yeah, Dragonshire, of course, a map where you still want to have some global pressure. Rexa oftentimes banned because he's still the king. <laughs> the Ixia target bans. Damn, they banned Lucio and Brightwing. That's a lot of respect that they have for the support player on Crystal Gaming. There's the Rexa ban. I just mentioned him. The king of Dragonshire gets banned. We have ETC still around for the stage dive. Falstad is still there. Dehaka could be possibly played if you want to have more global pressure. But yeah, that is pretty nuts. And Ana plus Garrosh get picked. So you can combo that off with Li Ming and so many other heroes. But it is incredible that they respect Ixia to an extent that they would sacrifice two bans to ban out two supports that a lot of other teams wouldn't give the time of day. Insane. Honestly insane. So yep, here we go. We could see some interesting picks now. Honestly, with Garrosh and Ana taken, if they take Zarya and create a strong foreman with a hero that can rotate nicely between the mid and the top lane, that would be pretty nuts. It's not usually a play that you see on Dragonshire. Usually you are more so looking at someone that is just trying to sit up at the top side. But there's a lot of nasty plays that could be made. Medivh gets banned out, so no shenanigans here. No saves also when Garrosh tries to flip someone over. But this is really a tricky one. Vala is still up for the taking if someone wants her. Ana, of course, could combo with Jaina, which is another potential ban that we could see coming in from Pepe My Lady now. So that's definitely a thing. But it is getting quite bananas here. <laughs> and they are hesitating for good reason. There's a lot that they could ban out now. And they decide to ban my F. Had enough after game number one with her locking everybody down. And what is Crystal Gaming now doing? They're kind of known for their, like, a little bit out-of-the-box picks. They don't go... Well, sometimes they go a little bit crazy. We've seen Probius again, who was the first pick hero that they set through in Division S Season 2 when they started last week into their first match. Ah, well. A bit hesitant on this one as well, though. Jimmy is in, and Sylvanas! Okay, not quite what I expected, but fair enough. We're still waiting for the offlane, though. Slate hasn't made a choice here yet. And with the blue team now going for their final two picks, they have to make a choice. Will Q and ETC, you know, are they sending him onto the offlane instead? If he plays ETC, is it a Blaze topside? 
Is someone going for maybe Leo, Marthale, Dehaka, all of them still up? Urel can obviously be played too in that spot. And they need a bit more damage on this as well. There's the bird, okay. And Kira! Kira and Falstad both taken. Okay, off we go. Slade now knows what he's facing on that offlane, so they can counteract it a little bit, but that's definitely a setup that is not necessarily the normal one on the map. And when it comes to control, they want to have a global to counteract Falstad and the potential ETC stage dive, even though now he's free to go into Mosh Pit. And that sets it up for the second map. Dragonshire is map two. The lead goes to Crystal Gaming as we are heading into the second map of the best of five series here in Division S Season 2. Game on! Pepe, my lady! On map number two against Crystal Gaming with the Will Q on ETC. Dylan Malfurion, Sasa Boss on Falstead, Richu on Liming, and Gore Rider is playing Kira. Over to the right side of the map, Crystal Gaming with Kolios on Jimmy. We have Ixi on Anna, Slate on Dehaka, Yazu on Sylvanas with extra push power here. And Skewubi is playing Garrosh in game number two. All right, let's set this game on the road. Ooh, a grenade build, actually. Not the standard sleeping dart build that we see in Europe these days on Anna. So he actually goes into the biotic grenade. We get go. Also, Might of the Banji Queen over potential stacking. ETC with a block party over his own globe talent. And falls dead with a Ming wingman on level one as a maximum effort comes through. There's the slide, there's the setup, and Slade nearly dies, but instead it's Q that gets thrown over into the tower range from Garrosh, and another early kill for Crystal Gaming. I mean, these guys are doing a great job with that. They did it in the first game, they do it in the second game. I think in game three, Pepe and my lady should just simply not brawl with them in the middle. It doesn't really go well for them. So, top laners obviously starting to make their move. Yasu is also sitting there. Down at the bottom of the map, a little bit more damage is already coming in. Kira is venturing out, and there's the attack. Drag doesn't connect. Gore Rider is able to get away. <laughs> the immediate ping on the Arca is like, dude, why didn't you connect that? Call yours. <laughs> no chance. Says the boss, there's the counter kill, and they might even get another one against Ana. Oh! <laughs> 50 HP! Ixir, you fucking beast! Uh, he survives. And again, we're looking at him having a bit of a problem. Says the boss with the barrel roll out. But damn, this game is opening up already aggressively as we have two kills, one for each team, and a lot of brawls happening all over the place. With now Siege Giants getting taken at the bottom of the map. The Haka still trying to control the top as much as he can against Kira. Go Rider. Needs to be a bit careful. It's not gonna necessarily going to be easy for Kira on that lane, especially with the continuous rotations that we've now seen from Crystal Gaming. Silvana's moving topside multiple times already. It's a divide in the shrines. Bot side versus top side right now. Camps taken, as previously mentioned by both teams. Dehaka still in the 1 1 situation against Kira. And Dehaka, I mean, it is a close call up there, actually. Uh, Gorider needs to be careful too. Falstad is flying in and that changes things quickly. That's the power of having a global in this situation. Slate moves out and actually survives this. But of course, the blue team sacrificed the uh, fourth hero there. Sylvanas rotates over to help out. And they're actually getting the kill against Kira. Yeah, that caught her apparently a bit off guard. Willie Q comes in too. It's a party, ladies. It is a party. And there's another kill. Now Sylvanas is also dead, but he's about to retake that shrine, which means that in the mid lane there's an opportunity for the Dragonite. ETC has rotated over quickly to deny it to Jimmy, who is now sitting tight there, trying to interrupt it for as long as he possibly can. Fight or flight for him. Jimmy's still in play. Needs a penetrating round if Will Q gets too aggressive. And there it is. Nice interrupt on the slide. That was actually well done. Ah, interesting approach. Your pain, my gain is currently taken here. Okay. So at this point, something that helps a little bit on the solo lane for sure, but it's not the usual setup that we see for Kira on that level. Very different from the build that Kai, uh, that Tai, for example, has now been popularizing throughout the entire 
set up of Division 1 and even in tournaments afterwards on the Hero. But for the solo lane, of course, it's going to be a little bit helpful. And that battle just goes on and on and on and on. And it's always the other heroes that start to move in to, to put the additional damage in. But Gore Rider with the MLG plays here. The big boy moves in order to get out of harm's way. There's still pressure on the blue team to uh, defend the Dragonite in the middle. And the aggression towards the top side is just mounting up with Slade now in trouble. Dodges out on some of the damage. Sylvanas comes in. The Arca is down in the middle of the map. They're trying to get it done. And ETC with the interrupt just as Falsat is doing his thing. The minion gets thrown over instead of Vilky, but they still might get the kill and they barely miss out on it. Now it's, of course, a reverse situation. Guys, this game is going up there at top speed. All of a sudden, we have two blue shrines channeling for the Dragonite in the middle. Level 7 talents are ready for both of them. And there's the kill against Reyna. Jimmy down, topside recaptured though. Four kills against two. Pepe my lady with a much better opening into this game now than they had in the previous on the previous map. But there's another three-man setup. Nice dodge. Nicely done here initially. But there's the drag and I think it's gonna be the end of Kira regardless. Yeah, Gore Rider is down. Bot lane gets pushed. <laughs> this map is all over the place, seriously. They are everywhere right now. Calamity is in, Wilkie gets thrown over. Full on lightning rod by build by the way. So not even boomerang taken here for Falstead. Which honestly in this situation makes a little bit more sense since Falstead isn't even the solo laner and I don't think we're gonna see him with a lot of split push uh, setup. As I've said in the past, Boomerang is gonna be the talent that you see in 95% of the cases for good reason. But if you go into a full on lightning rod build, you can definitely make that play. And the way that he's currently trying to fly in to get kills with the team with um, nice um, combos. That actually can get a little more single target damage onto the target once that you start to gank up properly. Uh, says the boss is trying to defend here. Kira at the top again, going up against uh, against the Harker. Down here the fight continues too. Jimmy still has the solo lane at the bottom of the map, all to his own. But in comes Sylvanas and Gore Rider. He must just hate this. Every single time he has a nice setup. There's immediately another hero from Crystal Gaming rotating towards the top. These passes just don't respect the one-on-one. -on -one. I don't know what to say there, but yeah. They're going for the full-on gank setup. Sleep darts everywhere as they're trying to finally nail that Dragonite. Now Riju on Liming is capturing the bottom shrine. And Kolios is all alone. He can't really do anything about it. It's a good penetrating round through against Q. That could have been the end of him, though. And with Sylvanas, the top side at least gets pushed. And that one was actually quite nicely done. And if the fountain goes down, that's a big problem for Kira in the long run. Yeah, and she saves it, just for now. Okay, is there a drag? No, but ETC is there too. <laughs> it's again, they're everywhere. The rotations are currently mad, and now we have level 10 abilities, of course, for both sides, which gives us the Eye of Horus for Ixir. Doesn't really have anything to properly nano boost in this game. So he goes for the alternative talent. Uh, go right against Slade, still topside, and Sylvanas is making those rotations, as we've seen from the beginning of the game, to put more pressure onto Kira whenever she can. 12,000 damage for Jimmy, puts him into uh, the top seat on the red team. But Kira in particular on that uh, solo lane has already started to get a lot of value from that poke against the Haka. Uh, Garrosh in a bit of trouble, gets the taunt through, and there it is, the kill attempt against Richu, Tranquility, but the end is Jimmy Holmes in with the auto attack, also more Eye of Horus value being had here as they go for a second kill setup, with Li Ming down, they have the upper hand now and can recapture the shrine, but towards the top we still have the battle, and Kira still has her ult, but ETC comes in too, and that's the kill against the Haka. <laughs> Oh my god. But that's of course a chance at the bottom of the map to get pressure going on here. <laughs> it's all about trade-offs in this game. It's a super fast pace that we currently have and the trade-offs are just absolutely incredible. I mean, as ETC moves topside, they of course have the upper hand at the bottom of the map and they use it to break through the wall. Now, the opponent is trying to make a similar play all the way up towards the top. There's still the ult for Kira, but dodged out by Yasu. Nicely done. And the fight is Nova. No. Dehaka is coming back to business. Eight minutes without a break, pretty much. False set fly immediately bot lane. The mobility here is crazy, and Kolios is about to fall. Or is he? 
Well, yes, the mighty gust actually zones out Garrosh and also Anna, so they can't keep Reyna alive. And all of a sudden, we're looking at six kills against five and a small advantage for Pavel, my lady. They're losing structures, but they're doing well on the kills now. ETC is taking over the top shrine on the other hand, and that's a big problem because that means that Kira has an opportunity to take the one in the middle. And uh-oh, yep, they get it. Dragon Knight number one with a level 13 talents taken by the blue team. They are heavily pushing back against Crystal Gaming, game number two. Much better setup for them right now. Very close game, but this is just so different from what we observed in game number one. It's pretty incredible now. Thunder Strikes for Falstead as he's getting more damage in. Also the Illusionist now. Kira hasn't made a choice yet and ETC is the one fighting it out with the Haka at the top as the rest of the map is being conquered by the rotation towards the bottom. Three heroes and of course the Dragonite with all those Dragon Brats in the mid lane trying to drop a fort. Not sure they can take the fort down but they definitely get a lot of value here and now ETC with stage dive ready can always jump in if he needs to. For the time being, he's just trying to get them the experience lead up at the top. And they're half a level ahead. Half a level for them right now. But yep. There we have it again. Colios is already in. And another punt against Dehaka. Dragonite comes through here. Alrighty. So, Richu is sitting at the side. And gets caught and dropped. What a setup again. Damn. Surprise, motherfucker. No chance for Li Ming. She goes down, and it was a beautiful trap that we saw executed from Crystal Gaming. The fight again just starting up here. Ah, but it's no follow up kill. It's a 5 versus 4, and of course, the goal is to go straight up for the camp, and it doesn't really seem like Pepe Malady can do anything about it. Not with them being one hero down. So instead, they have to play this a little bit more careful for the time being. Six kills against six, level 14, nearly 15 for both of the teams. The rotation now down to the bottom, where of course one of the night camps can be taken. Siege Giants have to be defended against first. We have another camp already about to be claimed by Kolios on the right side as he's going for those Giants. Night camp at the bottom of the map could be timed together with it. And the Haka is already sitting at the top so that he can move down at any point. So here we go. 15 and a half. There's the Siege Giants. Again, the darts come out. Ixia sitting tight. And in comes Jimmy from the top. Riding the money pick in style as he should. But there's the pressure play. And ETC is starting to decide road towards the bot lane. Well, actually, he changes his mind. Stays in the middle. There's a bit of a setup here against him. And they're trying to get the kill. Stun doesn't come through. Kira comes in. She needs to be careful now. That's the bigger problem, I'd say. Gorider gets barely out. And that was close since Garrosh was nearly able to stun her out, which would have led to a kill. But now we have a level 16 talents. The mirror ball already claimed instantaneously by Li Ming. Both teams are level 16, I might add. Also, the showstopper is in for now. The elongated tongue. Life drain after Remorseless. They're making some plays up to the top again. Slimovi is there. And here comes the silence. And ETC gets out. Nicely done. Eye of Horus even activated from Ana. That didn't change anything. Paint him red now for Jimmy. Says the boss with the mighty gust to create some space. The Haka controls the top. Nobody at the bot lane now. But traps everywhere. Yeah, and Forza with the crippling hammer. Tries to get the extra slow out. But the aggression is once again focusing on the top side. ETC has snuck down to the bottom of the map. Taking the safe route. Reyna's coming in too. Up at the top. Root is on the ground. There's the sleep dart once again. They go for Dyla. There's the taunt and there's the kill. Easily done. Malfurion down. ETC jumps in. Gets the setup again. Sylvanas. And they drop her. Sylvanas down. Jimmy rotating into the middle. Could go for the Dragonite now. But Forsett is already moving in to interrupt the potential channel. And in the meantime, Gore Rider is taking a bit of a beating here. Jimmy is also getting attacked. Midside Assessibos goes in. And Kolios goes down. Top side, the same is going to happen to Kira. It's just kills everywhere. Eight kills against eight. ETC rotating towards the bottom again to recapture the shrine. In the meantime, those minions are still pushing. And this game is just absolutely nuts. I mean, Jesus Christ. Up to the top, Ixia and Richu are still fighting it out. And adrenaline is just a pumping. There's the sleep dart again. And the tongue doesn't connect. And again, he gets pinged for it. Gets pinged. There's the kill. Potentially. Oh, 
living survives the cast into it. And there's the kill against Ana with a follow-up attempt against the Haka. And I guess he's going to get away. But holy hell, what a game. <laughs> Look at the top damage, by the way. 25,000 only for Jimmy, but they get another kill, don't they? Yes, Li Ming is dead once more. Li Ming is down, 25,000 damage over here, 42,000 for Kira, 35 for False Dead, and now Sylvanas is dead. It is just blow for a blow. The entire game. Dear God that I don't believe in what is happening here. Li Ming, by the way, this time without the glass cannon, thankfully. Maybe a mispick in the last game. Malfurion down. The fight still continue. Reyna dies too. It's blow for blow the entire game. They're trying to make a play for Kira again. And she indeed gets dropped. Which puts us into a 3 versus 2 situation. Ana is back to business. <laughs> it's just bonkers. 22 kills. 14 minutes in. They try to go for the Dragonite. Maybe this time they can actually grab it. ETC is moving towards the top. It was a little bit too slow there. And yeah, they don't even try. They know what's happening. Can't really make it happen yet, but this game is just nuts. It's all over the place. Take a look at the experience, by the way. Minion experience, 37,000 against 34,000. So right now, the blue team, they're not quite rotating as aggressively as we're seeing from Crystal Gaming, despite the fact that Falset is, of course, all over the place with this global. But that's why they have a slight advantage, because they were able to soak more minion experience. Guys, we're nearly on level 20, and we've just seen an entire brawl from start to finish in this game. It's honestly a bit nuts. Ganks everywhere, setups against isolated heroes, fantastic plays from both teams, and what a second game it is. Sylvanas is taking the top as Garrosh is holding to the bot lane, so both of them will be controlled, both shrines, in just a moment. But with level 20 being closer for Pip and My Lady, I don't really see a world in which this leads to a Dragonite now, unless there is a fight on 20 talents. And for that to happen, Crystal Gaming will need to soak a few more waves. And they're currently trying to do their top side with the Haka. There's level 20. Mighty Gust upgraded into the wind tunnel and also Serenity now taken. Tal Rushas is in, Death Metal, 20 versus 20, is now available and are starting to make their plays here. Again, Garrosh walks out, slight fight in the middle, and the channel retaken. Yazu with the bolt of the storm, jumped away by the fighter at the bottom of the map. That's a different story, Malfury is barely getting out. Will Q is low, and stage dives away. Is trying to go for Kolios, but they can't get the kill, and Garrosh is there for the save, and Ixia just heals them time and time again. Again, the double channel on the side of Crystal Gaming. Falstead moving into the middle. Does he have a global to fly topside? Does he even try to? They get the kill against Garrosh down here. Another kill attempt with a reset against Ixia. And he goes down too. Double kill for Pepe, my lady. And now the opportunity to maybe even go for Sylvanas, who barely makes it out. The chance to get the Dragonite again for the Polish team. Napir Dalai. They're starting to move from camp to camp now, pushing the bottom of the map with camp and maybe even the Dragonite. Already with Sigor Rider right taking position in the middle of the map. Falstead is not risking anything here. The fort is taking damage as we speak. Talking damage, the output right now with 41,000 for Jimmy, 54 for Kira, and they're going for it right away. They're not even trying to make a play for the Dragonite, despite the kills that they got. They have at the top now the problem that the Harker gets attacked again as he's finally going for the channel here, but Kira is helping out too. There's a little bit more coming up as we see more heroes moving in, and damn, that was nearly a kill against Slade, but this is the channel attempt. Ford at the bot lane is down, Camp is pushing, Camp over here taken, Broccoli sees it, ETC slides in, and steals it away. The Polish with a steal right there. And that's the fort in the mid lane. Destroyed the fort at the top lane is going to suffer massively since those knights are making their way over. And at the bottom of the map, the Dragonite is trying to go for their keep. What a setup! What an absolute setup here. And Pepe, my lady, looking better and better and better. Totally different team, totally different setup from game number one. Much, much stronger from them. They haven't won the map yet, but this is definitely a very different showing from what we've seen in game number one. There's again ETC coming in, trying to go for the slide. Wind Tunnel is already out, creating some space for them to drop that keep, and that's indeed what they do. The top four, you might have guessed it already, it's also falling right now. Bottom of the map, Li Ming still needs to be careful, but they are starting to jump away at this point. Yeah. 13 against 11. 
That's what we currently have here. Every single fort is down. Blue team hasn't lost anything yet. There's the team fight. There's the big fight. That's the big one. Will Q down. And he doesn't hit anything with a death mosh. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. They're trying to go for Cesar Boss. They can't get the kill here. But with a 5 versus 4, they can steal a few of those camps away. And they also have to deal with the top side, of course. There's not a lot left here. So this is maximum going through the wall. And not more than that. But it's definitely a concern in the long run. Especially since more and more catapults are, of course, eventually going to push for it. But they're not sending anybody over just yet. It's 13 kills against 12. I mean, 13 versus 12, it is incredibly close. So now with Sylvanas, they have of course a lot of push potential, despite the fact that it's only a single hero that has been eliminated. And that is going to cost Paper My Lady the bottom fort. But there's another camp that has been acquired by the blue team and will push topside now onto the Bridge of Death. Oh, ho -ho, the insta kill against Kira! What a taunt! The Warlord's challenge here by Garrosh. Nicely done, and that is a staggered death that they are gonna have a hard time recovering from. Look at that pressure play. With the siege shines, they barrel through the bot lane, and it seems like they're gonna try to use Sylvanas to drop that keep. If they can equalize the pressure on the bot lane, that would be absolutely fantastic. Top side is still a concern, but right now they're just pushing. They're trying to get the maximum uh, value out of the kill against Kira. But this is starting to go through the wall, of course. So someone has to move back and deal with it unless they are willing to commit even further and maybe try to go for core or second key. But so far, it doesn't seem that way. Fort should be taken, also the walls should be taken down eventually. You want to deny a bit of vision at least. But as the keep is about to get attacked, Yasu is moving in and is making the play there. What a game! <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's honestly nuts. This is a crazy series. I absolutely love this game. This was a fantastic map so far, and I would love for a few more maps like this to drop into our hands. 65,000 damage from Kira now. 51k for the opponent. Dodge on the drag. Uh, Slate. Can they actually catch the will queue here as he rotates? Yep, that's a problem. That's a stun. He tries to slide away, and there's the sleep there. That's a kill, guys. It could be a kill. No, Falstead is ready for it. Falstead with the mighty gust saves him. Uh, that was a cooldown that they needed to burn. He was dead in the waters. If that doesn't happen, it's... Yeah, it, they lose ETC, and that could lead to a Dragonite. And this late in the game, 21 minutes in, a Dragonite that is taken with one hero down could easily mean the end of the game. That's a big problem there. But yeah, let's have a bit of a look. The rotation towards the top from ETC this time. Ah, trying to make a play of Malfury. They can't get it, though. ETC is actually not moving in. They didn't have vision yet. Now that they know that there's more heroes in the mid lane and at the bottom, and he knows that it isn't a trap, he's going to channel it. But we have Sylvanas at the bottom reacting in kind and making sure that there is not enough pressure against them. Ring around the rosy play that we oftentimes see on this map. Falser hasn't died yet, by the way, which is honestly pretty impressive given the circumstances here. Camps are taken, and while the red team takes the one at the bottom of the map, it seems like the blue team is just saying, well, you can have it. We don't really care about that. We're going to grab the one at the top, and that will push your keep. Because the question is, is the red team really willing to commit to an attack here? They might. Yes, they're going for a double camp and push for core. Now, you can try and sneak in, of course, a DK behind this, but if this reaches the core, this could be in trouble. So it's a double camp that has to be responded to. And they're not pushing with it. Would be a bit of a YOLO move, but it would be a move that you can execute if you want to. So starting to take down the tower, at least in the middle. If they take the fountain down, that would also help because, well, <laughs> you don't want your opponent to have the option to move back and quickly tap the fountain here. Do anything. The Haka, top side. The Globals, of course, like super powerful right now. Uh, and where's the assistance over here? Keep is taking damage. Needs to take the catapult down. Needs to take it down quickly. Yep. Catapult about to get wrecked. But they're just running past each other. They're all waiting for that one moment when you can finally maybe lock down on a target, get an isolated kill, or get a good setup for the team fight. But so far, nobody is opening themselves up for that attack. But both teams are looking good right now. <laughs> and it's such a close game. Uh, Falstead is trying to protect the camp a little bit. It's the only one that's up on the map, so everybody is, of course, looking for it. Sylvanas is at the top. It's pushing that out easily. No problems there for her. And here we go. There's the attack. Siege damage on Sylvanas. 173,000. Li Bing. 208,000. 
Camp is about to be taken. They're going for the fight. Bottom channel. ETC goes to the top. He's late. ETC is late. ETC is late. They need to interrupt the middle. And... Yep. They do that immediately. Ah, ETC was actually closer in time than I thought. Alright. <laughs> oh, God. I can't believe that they fought in the mid lane. Or at least the fountain is still there. Yeah, they go for another setup. Scouting things out with uh, the Raiders. 24 minutes in. <laughs> Nobody wants to lose this. Everybody knows that if you fall in a trap now, it, the game's over. And this is rotating around all game, every day. Playing around the camps that open up. Try to rotate around the opponent a little bit. Exchanging shrines. Top for bottom, bottom for top. Pressuring again. Wind tunnel is in. They go for the kill against Scarosh. And they get it. The kill is in. Pepe, my lady. The Polish team with a setup. Now they go for Anna. Ixia is about to go down. And they want more kills than that. Ixia is just running away. He gets the sleeping darts out. Is he actually going to be able to save himself? No, it's not happening. They get the kill. Two heroes down. And now, how do the remaining three react? They need to either buy time or set something else up here. And it's going to be insane. So they move immediately down to the bottom, trying to play the ring around the rosy game a little bit longer as ETC takes the top. Silvanas barely makes it out of that. They're buying time as much as they can, but this is trouble. 25 minutes in, a Dragonite is going to do so much damage here. Limin comes in with a bit of a pushback. Dehaka, can he move up to the top and maybe risk it? Does he still have the global? Because ETC is already working on the DK and he's only going to grab it. DK is in and this is going to be a big problem for Crystal Gaming. We are very likely looking at a tie in the series here. This is going to be a 1-1. The Dragonite is moving down towards the bottom of the map. Garrosh is back. He was the one that they could take down with a nice mighty gas. The wind tunnel from Falstad. There's another one. They open up an alley towards the core. And this has to be it. Yeah, that beast is just chunking away. Look at that damage. 25 minutes in. That Dragonite doesn't hit like a truck. He picks the truck up and hits the core with the truck. One hit after another, just murdering that thing. And the core goes down. The heroes fall, but it doesn't matter. This is the victory for Paper My Lady in game number one as they win their first map in Division S Season 2. GG, and well played. Game number three. Second one was a blast. I would not mind another three of that level because it was just a brawl from beginning to end with a pretty nice macro level then at the uh, end of the game, the very end of the game. And that kill against Garrosh just set everything up. Falset making the play here, finding the angle for the wind tunnel, getting that through, Malfurion with the roots. You can only dodge so much with Indomitable, and at some point he just took too much damage. And then we also had, of course, the stage dive of ETC to just flatten him like a pancake there. So nicely played, and that puts us in a tie in this series. It was the first map win in this season for Pepe My Lady. Keep in mind, they went up against Washed Up on the first play day the champion of season one so they couldn't take a single map there but at least against crystal gaming they were able to lock one in and these maps are gonna matter a lot of people think well it's all about the match wins and of course those are highly important but if you can secure yourself a couple of map wins even in the matches that you lose you will always have a better standing in the ranking at the end of the season and we've seen now multiple times already how incredibly close it those can be so that map was worth a lot for them in the long run Again, Deathwing gets banned out. We had multiple Deathwing games, at least in North America. In Europe, I think we only had one thus far, which was Washed Up, who we actually were able to lock him in on Battlefield of Eternity. Against, as it turns out, Paper Mama Lady, if I'm not mistaken. And Nick had a lot of fun with the hero, ended up with top damage. I think it was around 90,000. It was on this map, Battlefield of Eternity. And, well... There's the Lucio ban again. <laughs> they let Brightwing go through this time, but apparently they really, really don't like that my F. So the red team has another ban available. So far, none of the usual damage dealers that oftentimes gets ta get targeted on Battlefield of Eternity have been eliminated. Meaning Vala with an arrow build is still up. Liming can still be first picked. We have Greymane around. Zarya is a hero that you sometimes get uh, to see here too. We just saw her recently. As Laura's fan club played her here with big success, of course. Uh, Svamkrota with that combo. 
ETC gets banned. Damage dealers are all up. So, yep. Here we go. First pick. Oftentimes again Li Ming, but what is the Polish team deciding for? What do they want here? <laughs> it's kind of funny always to me when we're heading into game number three or game number four and you see teams all of a sudden just start to pick a lot slower because they really have to think through all of the alternatives and iterations of what can be taken, but they decide with the standard opening and begin with Li Ming as the first pick. But for Crystal Gaming side, it becomes more interesting because they are the team that oftentimes try to throw a bit of a curveball within the draft. There's a lot to be picked here. I mean, you could pick Oriel, Vala, just to name one setup. But there is so much, and especially Crystal Gaming, the former Kiko Combo team has a lot there. They go for the Zarya and Vala version. Ixia and his Zarya, pretty sick as well. And I talked about it during the ban phase already. It is an option for this map, and he locks it down immediately. So Lauba's fan club, they've shown the way here. Now we have Zarya coming in. That could also lead to Garrosh being banned or taken away, since, of course, the speed bubble on Zarya on level 4 empowers Garrosh even more. And we've seen some solid Garrosh plays already on the last map without that advantage. And yeah, there's the Garrosh pick. Makes sense. Makes a lot of sense there. Okay, so Ana is taken for the nano boost, and Garrosh is also taken away. Now we're heading into the bans, and offlane is something that you can target now. When it comes to supports to ban out, I feel with this setup, you have to at least consider banning out Aureal. But of course, there's a lot more supports too that would really do well here. Rega being one example, since he can uh, supply the lightning shield that helps out with a bit more damage. Vala likely with an arrow build here. Of course, on the map, Graming gets banned so that the opponent doesn't have too much rush potential on the Immortal. And what exactly is Pippin, my lady, going to get rid of? That's a bigger question right now. Okay. I mean, you can target the tank or the support. I mean, even offlane. Zarya is, of course, going to be part of that four-man uh, four move at the bottom of the map. Or likely, at least. Well, <laughs> yeah, that's the Oriel ban. <laughs> okay, so leaves us with Rhaegar. Malfurion would be a pick. Then again, time will tell. I'm at this point honestly a little bit more interested in what exactly we're going to see for the offlane from the two teams. That's going to be highly interesting here too. You can go for aggressive variations, can play around Thrall a little bit. Blaze is still open since none of those heroes were banned yet. In theory, Malthael would be another one that you could drop if you really wanted to. Oh, Chen... And Johanna. Okay, the front line is in, so is the offlaner. But now Pippin My Lady knows exactly what they're up against here. And what's going to be the play. It's the last pick rotation for them. So now they have to show their cards. What's going to be the second damage? And more importantly, what's going to be the offlaner that has to deal with Chen on the lane? I mean, with Garrosh around, they already have the have a, some CC there, but they should stack a little bit more if they want to set it up for Li Ming in the nano boost. Oh my god, they go for that Itanas bullshit again. Oh, they did that already the other day. They have a couple of, like, these picks, Paper My Lady, where I'm just always just face-palming hard, and they actually go for Artanis with this now. And false that on top of that. Oh god. Honestly, when they did it against Washed Up, I really thought they were trolling. Now seeing it again from them, I'm really worried. That is not something that I would give a big chance here. Yeah. Anduin has the support on the side of Crystal Gaming. And holy hell, Pepe, my lady with Artanis. One of the worst offlaners and traditionally the noob trap with the amateur opponent on level 1 for Battlefield of Eternity. All right, they believe in their chances. Let's see if they can pull it off. Battlefield of Eternity, map number three. Game on, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I expect a loss for Pepe My Lady. The Artanis pick is something that I can absolutely not condone. And so far, the heroes is pretty much not picked on the high level and for very good reason. They believe in their chances to make it happen, though. So we'll see if they have a shot of turning things around with Artanis. I'm doubtful. But I am absolutely okay being convinced otherwise. Yes, let's see if Pippa My Lady has well, he's got the secret to Atanas on the map. The Will Q on Garrosh, Dylan on Anna, Richie on Falstead, Gorite on Liming, and Sassabos on Atanas. 
And on the right side of the map, Kolios and Vala, Yasu and Anduin for Crystal Gaming. We have Skewobi on Johanna, Ixi on Zarya, and Slade on Chen. And the aggression already topside, where Atanas has to deal with the four man. And that forces a very quick rotation from the rest of the blue team because Atanas alone can't handle that and they don't have the same push power as their opponent. Interestingly enough, Hot Pursuit on level 1 for Vala. Not what you usually see here. Normally it's a full-on arrow build that we see on this map. And Atanas, he does what he does first best. One. He dies. Exactly. The cannon fodder already down for the first time. Falls up with an auto-attack build. Amateur opponent. The talent that makes some people believe that the hero is actually useful here. Spoiler alert, he isn't. But Vala going into a Hot Pursuit build is actually really interesting. I'm a bit curious to see what she follows up with that. There's still that hybrid approach that you could go into the additional arrow talent on level 4 and 7 if you really wanted to. If you don't think that Monster Hunter is a good choice. But I don't really think that's ever going to be a play here. Because Monster Hunter is one of the talents that gives you the most value with the arrow build for the objective. So uh, multi-shot build, very likely going to be the play. After the tactical death of Atanas, we now have him at the bottom of the map, so he's finally in that one-on-one -on -one situation against Chen, as you would already expect. Up at the top, it's a different story though. Big fight happening. Will Q with a throw against Vala and the immediate save from Anduin. That's of course one of the cool things if you play Anduin against Garrosh. Whenever there's a throw from Garrosh against one of your allies, you can just simply zip him back out. This is exactly what they're doing. Zarya's taking the position on the camp and this is saying like hey by all means come in i'm going to laser you to death maximum charge on level one for her and here's the attack with the camp and the pressure at the top lane that might even lead to them taking down the first tower here false with the three stacks right now of course there's also a blind that has to be accounted for there's a level seven talents uh, sorry level four talents getting ahead of ourselves a little bit and vala's in trouble vala's in a lot of trouble barely dodges out on it Kolios is moving away, and they just barely saved her. Anduin already with the heals ready. A little bit of a flame sub at the bottom of the map where Chen is currently getting his act on. And in we go. There comes also the give me 20. No speed bubble needed in this game for the mobility here. At the same time, hammer gains for false stats. So following up with the auto attack a little bit more. Triumphorate, traditional build for Li Ming so far as well on this map. Well... Again, all level 4 talents here are more or less viable for this map. And for Vala, as expected, multi-shot. Nothing else made sense after Hot Pursuit on level 1. Again, there is still the hybrid build that you can go for with Hot Pursuit into arrows, but that's nothing you would ever play on Immortal Shrines. Uh, yeah, on, sorry, on Immortal Shrines, yeah. But, uh, Battlefield of Eternity, so yeah. <laughs> and there's another kill attempt. Can they actually drop the will queue? I don't really think so. But yeah, multi-shot build already doing a thing. But it's actually interesting that they are not really heading into the arrow build since that is just one of the best builds for Vala to drop that immortal as quickly as you can. So they're already signaling that they're totally okay focusing on team fights and a bit of wave clear with it as well. Of course, Vala is now starting to join the fun, but Will Q is zoning that out a little bit. Uh, Tannis is trying to use the amateur opponent against the Immortal right now. And they have, at this point, the better Immortal pressure. If Vala would have gone into the arrow build, that might look a little bit different. But for the time being, that's definitely the case. Top lane gets pushed, though, as the camp gets value. A little more pressure over here. Vala and the Panda, in the meantime, trying to win the halftime show for the team. But, of course, the red team has now a shot at the Immortal. Goes straight in and takes a slight lead over their opponent. And Ixir gets thrown in. And Anduin can't really save anything there, so Zarya is actually down. So far, so good. So they're trying to burn this down, but it seems like the first Immortal is going to end up in the hands of Pepe, my lady. It's not really a big surprise, honestly, with what they have in the arsenal, with Atanas giving the initial value here. But once that the game continues, it's of course all about the team fights for Crystal Gaming. That seems to be their strategy. So death timers increasing is a big part of that. For now, 30% roughly speaking as a shield on the Immortal as the blue team takes a slight advantage here. Falset is the one at the bottom of the map, so he has the chance to fly topside. Has gone into Boomerang on level 7 as he should with this build. And at the top with Vala now heading into Arsenal. They're already trying to defend here. And 
setting everything up for a possible defense of the fort itself because that's obviously on the menu now for Pepe my lady and they're starting to jump in with a little bit of a swap attempt by Atanis not really as much as they were probably hoping for but they get the flip against Vala she vaults out Atanis is f uh, quickly falling back here and Anduin actually helped. Yeah, nice dodge here again on the swap, but the fort is down regardless. With Falstead flying in, it was a 5 versus 4 towards the end as well, so they couldn't really do a whole lot there. But a nice advantage now for the blue team in this game. Nicely done here. Uh, Slade, on the other hand, starting to make the jump at the bottom of the map. And yeah, they're sitting tight for now. But the Immortal is down. So far, only one, one fort has fallen. The one at the top side for the blue team has taken a little bit of damage, but was never really in danger. Now it's camps that the teams are going to focus again on. Calamity is also in after Boomerang, so both of the obvious talents. We have for Atanas the Warp Cygnus. Gets a little bit of a slow if he actually connects it. Up to this point, we've seen a lot of good dodges from the red team, but eventually he is going to connect one of them. And topside pressure now with that camp. And Falsehood is very much alone. So they're very likely going to slide away from this one. Seems like the teams are just absolutely happy to wait for the next objective, wait for level 10, and then play around the rogue abilities. Atanas is going in deep, by the way. Zarya is sitting there. Atanas went way too deep for this one. But there's the quick swap against Ixia. Where's Anduin? There he is. And he immediately counters that as much as he can. And they're still making the play for Garrosh. And he does not have a chance. No, he doesn't have a prayer. So Garrosh goes down, initially a decent attempt by them. Now they're also trying to beat up Artanis here, and he's trying to go in for the swap, but the problem is that the rest is already following through, and <clears throat> Artanis dead, and both frontliners therefore eliminated. The Immortals spawning in another 20 seconds. Level 10 abilities, they're close for the red team. And they're actually debating a little bit to go for the fort here. And it seems like they do exactly that. Also nearly a kill against Liming as she was in trouble. And quite a bit of that. They're trying to get the fort. There's another save on Anna as she was also heavily attacked. Chen is at the bot lane getting a bit more experience to grab, give them the earlier heroic abilities. And they're starting to instantly go for the objective. Yeah, extra stun on Ixia. Tries to get the energy up on Zarya. And they are murdering the halftime show here quickly. Red team this time, or sorry, blue team this time is not quite as successful. The halftime show definitely claimed by Crystal Gaming. You know, they can focus on the camp if they want to sneak that in in the meantime, which they actually decide against. Teams have both level 10 abilities now. Suppression Pulse, of course, for Atanas. And, well, let's see. Chen can jump in now with the light bomb. Swap attempt, not successful. Will Q trying to follow it up too. Couldn't. Eat some damage here. And Vala also with the Reign of Vengeance. This time Eddie opting in for the stun instead of the strafe, which we've seen a lot more recently now. Ah, Corleos keeping his hatred up here as he attacks the camp. But can't really do that for too much longer. And they are again in a defensive position. Li Ming is making this a very uncomfortable spot, so they have to push out, which is what they're trying to do here. More poke. Johanna moving in, has to rush out too. Swap in, and Zarya still alive, but not for long. Oh my god, Anduin with the save again. But Zarya is dead, and Aten is, is he gonna get saved? Yes, they save him. Swap is not connecting, but there's another kill as Li Ming follows up with three kills in total. The fourth as Chen falls, and Pepe, my lady, with five kills against three, taking the big lead again and can go for another Immortal. Nicely played. Anduin, the sole survivor here. Ritual at the bottom of the map is getting more value for them, more experience. They're level ahead right now, and they are looking solid here. In comes the attack against a few remaining minions, but Anduin quickly realizes that throwing light around doesn't really do a whole lot of wave clear. There's a bit of a flip over there though, as Garrosh is trying to go for the play again. The cap is still taken by the red team, so at least they don't lose out on that. They're hoping for even a kill against Vilkyu before the Immortal appears on the lane, but the mighty gust of Falstead is keeping them at bay for now. Yeah, five kills against three. 19 stacks for Falstead, so his own auto attack quest is starting to get a little bit better. Still have the attack bot side focusing in. Chen is even buying some time for them. With them taking the camp top side, Falstead also has to at least react to it. So they are pushing the fight past the Immortal with a 5 versus 4. Yeah, can easily move back behind it. And the Immortal shouldn't really get the fort. Not as long as Falstead is occupied by the camp defense at the top of the map. 
Nah, they are burning this down quickly. Very, very quickly. But this is starting to become a moment where Crystal Gaming has to really see that they are winning some of those fights. Early game was not really a problem, falling a bit behind, but the strategy is heavily centered around that. Oh, the stun doesn't connect. Swap attempt is also unsuccessful for them. Level 13 talents give an advantage to Pepe Malady, so red team very likely not going to engage into those battles now. Melissa would be heavily surprised. Giant killer for false that is of course putting more pressure onto Chen in particular, but even Johanna if he gets that set up. And with a talent advantage, Pepe Malady is pushing, and so they should. They're starting to move to the bottom of the map to get some value there. By the way, damage output right now, 45,000. Solid damage. And a tennis and Garrosh with less than Anna. <laughs> and talking Garrosh. He actually tries to move around here to get a bit of a flank attempt, but the team already moved away from it and nobody is really willing to go for it yet. They still are far... I mean, they, they are half a level away from 13. They know they're in trouble here. Kills not against the back line, so... Uh, well, Andrew has Andrew hasn't died on the red team yet. But down here, pretty big problem too. All right, they have to be careful. This is this is one of those moments uh, or situations you don't want to be in. If you get flipped by Garrosh, if Atanas gets a swap through, when you're behind, you don't want to fight. And Chen isn't here, so need to be careful around this. But as long as they defend, they're totally fine. And Chen is sitting topside for the experience, and he's going to get level 13 for them just as the Immortal spawns, and that's exactly what's needed. Hearthstone's back. That's actually going to be quite a bit of damage against the fort if the entire wave makes it through. And the blue team has focused their attention onto their own camp now. Gloom is in. Also, the spell barrier is now through. And we're seeing them take position. Now, this is going to be a little bit of a... I mean, this is really going to be the big test. If you lose that fight too... Oh, ho, ho, the gust! The gust and the Tannis all to deny the kill. But that was a perfect plus shield here. Yeah, that was fantastic. If Falsett wasn't around, that would have been a kill. Now, that is a one for two cooldown trade that they just engaged into. Again, the swap attempt, not successful, but it's going to be a wild one. Top fort hasn't fallen, it's incredibly low, but it hasn't gone down. And now that they don't have the blessed shield anymore for the setup, it's a bit problematic. But there comes the triple panda setup against false that the kill against Vala. Our tennis for once in his life is actually useful. He's gonna mark that day in the calendar. But the bird is not out of harm's way yet. Barrel rolls away, light bomb, and Garrosh saves him. Garrosh with the save for Falstead. But Anna is on the run too. Don't think they can get the kill there either. But both of the lanes are now pushing against them. The swap is in. But that just means that Atanis himself is in a little bit of trouble. But he doesn't go down because Anna is just getting one dart in after another. Talking about darts. Sleep dart is in too. And here comes the attack again. 15 against 13. Bala back to business. Has to defend the bot lane. Has, thankfully for her, the multi-shot which she can now use. Should take the catapult down as quickly as possible. The keep is already down to 50% HP. Half a level until 16. And, well, the red team is starting to lose some value over here too. I can't believe they didn't go for the halftime show to buy themselves a little bit more time. So they give actually an opportunity to the opponent to play around that. Uh, here they go. Wilkie is getting attacked. Wilkie with a flip into the stun. So far, so good for him. Indomitable to get out and also getting away from Zarya's ult. But another setup with a stun. Wilkie, they just can't get the kill, can they? The panda finally with a hit. Halftime show won by the blue team. And this is a big pressure play at the top. Someone has to deal with it. And someone has to deal with it soon. If they don't go in, they risk losing a keep here. They need to send someone back. A little bit of a poke attempt at the bottom of the map right now. But the panda is creating some space for them. And it seems like Vala this time is going to be able to take the immortal down. Multi-shot build was a little bit of a risk there, honestly. If you go into an arrow build, you have much better pressure against the Immortal, and they definitely neglected a lot of that when they decided to change the build up. The Keep has taken serious damage, and it is still taking damage. They have to rotate over to take this, but they have a 50% Immortal now. But of course, it's starting to move to the bot lane, and the team in red doesn't have level 16, so they can't really make a big play here. There's a talent advantage for Paper My Lady, and they even went into Diamond Skin right now. Diamond Skin on 16 for Liming. Camps are taken. All that this Immortal does is buy enough time for Crystal Gaming to get level 16 talents. That's all that they can accomplish with this one. So once again, here's just a little bit of outside poke. They need to be careful as long as that gate isn't opened up. The Immortal is working on that as we speak. Falls at his top side, so he's trying to make sure that the fort top side doesn't fall either. But there's level 16 talent, so now they have a bit of an opportunity. Chen is on the way. 
but they're trying to at least get the fort here. And the fort they should be able to get. They grab it up, nearly even experience now. It's six kills against five, and they start to rotate for the second fort. Which would mean a lot. Taking both forts at this point in time would actually mean a whole lot because you would eliminate the catapult pressure more or less against you. Ixir taking a little bit of damage here, totally fine of course with the shield. And Vala eliminates the fort. Both forts down. Fairly even position now on the map. Still a lead of course for Paper My Lady. You look at the structures on the red team side and both of them have been you know, taking a lot of damage. But the advantage is shrinking. And Will Q might be in trouble. Trying to buy himself some space. There's the body blocks. Bless shield gets countered. And they can't get that kill. How deep are they willing to go here? The shield is in. There's the light bomb as he's trying to make the play. Jumps in deep. Slade is in trouble. Chen is down. He went too deep for this one. He just chased this too hard. And Fawcett has by now the giant killer. Now they're getting wrecked. They're getting absolutely wrecked right now. Three heroes down. That fight was not a good fight. They went into the fight. Now Falstad is trying to get another kill set up. Big, big problem here for Crystal Gaming. They went into a horrible battle, took the fight. They shouldn't have, and now they're getting wiped off the map, aren't they? They could lose the game right here. Down goes Anduin. That's a five-man team wipe. And now the keeps are falling. The keeps at least, if not the core. That was not a fight they should have taken. They went way too deep with it. Just as they came back into the game, they're all of a sudden getting murdered. And that is easily now leading to a potential victory for Pepe, my lady. Even with Artanis, they are able to win it. So, yeah, congratulations. Bit of a misplay there by Crystal Gaming. And Pepe, my lady, instantly pounces and capitalizes on it. Nicely done. Good job by Paper Lady taking the victory here and Crystal Gaming loses game number three. Alrighty, game number four. Guys, I am amazed. Paper My Lady has a 2-0 lead over Crystal Gaming. I honestly was after game number one a bit worried that we would see a 3-0 clean sweep from Crystal Gaming, but far from it. Paper My Lady coming up with a bit of an action play here and even winning with our tennis. I mean, that alone deserves applause. Nicely done. The hero finally was not only picked, but won also a map in competitive. I guess if you are actually nitpicking about it, like back in the HCC days, sometimes when a team was so far above the opponent, they memed it a little bit and picked Atanas. I mean, there was even Shogal once taken because the team was just memeing around a little bit, but he actually won a competitive match. So yeah, the first one, gotta be appreciated there. A little bit of a mistake there towards the end though. I'm still not quite sure why exactly you also would go into that multi-shot build over an arrow build on Battlefield of Eternity. Definitely made it difficult for them to get the pressure against the Immortal going, as you could tell during this. Zarya ending up also with the top damage in the game easily, so Vala not really getting too much for them. But either way, it's a lead. Paper My Lady is ahead, they deserve the lead, and they definitely stepped it up after the first map. And I'm happy for it, because as I said, I was afraid it would be a 3-0. Now we could even see a complete match win for Pepe My Lady, and that would shake up the standings quite a lot. Because Crystal Gaming has actually begun to establish themselves in everybody's head as a team that not only will make it into the top half of the ranking, but maybe has a chance to, over time, attack some of the top teams, or at least make it a little bit more difficult for him. So, Deathwing banned out again. The recent patch changes haven't done anything to deny that. We still have Zaratul and Falstad banned out. Volskaya Foundry as the map is, of course, going to change things up here a little bit too, especially on the support side. We could see some interesting things now, unless Paper My Lady targets Ixia again. But uh, yeah, in we go. Quick kill. Ban against Mayav. <laughs> yeah, they really don't like her, don't they? <laughs> Not after game one. And ETC gets locked in. Okay. There we go. All right, bring it. I'm, I'm curious. I'm curious. I'm, I'm really. I'm, I mean, it's, it's a really cool series. The game on Dragonshire was an absolute blast, and seeing them in the lead now, you have to respect that. So, what can the Polish team do there? Anna checking in. Anna checks in again. And Rexa. Okay, so we have Rexa already confirmed. Misha is in play. With Anna, they have a setup for Jaina, Liming. If they want to. 
also take it away from a potential Li Ming and Ana combo on the other side. That's another one. Mm, okay. Now let's have it. I'm waiting for that for that weirdo pick on Crystal Gaming side. Thrall? Okay. And Stukov. Nice. I like the Stukov pick. This is one of these a little bit more out of the box picks that I really enjoy here. It's not like Stukov doesn't get played at all, but you don't really see him all that often. Not when Malfurion and Rhaegar are still open. In the case of Ixia, it seems like he really loves a lot of the heroes that are not necessarily on the top level in the meta. But if you have a good ETC power slide or a Thrall route, then follow up with Stukov, especially after the virulent reaction on level 13. You can of course set up for a lot of burst damage, which could be addressed here. Yeah, but they actually ban Zarya out. She can be super, super annoying with this, of course, too. But I would be more worried about the damage progress at this point. Because there's still, of course, stuns that you can set up on top of it. But Jaina, in particular, would worry me slightly. Since that burst damage after a power slide into a Stukov lurking arm can be a problem. Garrosh gets banned out. Okay, they don't want to deal with Wilkie's Garrosh again. But what's, this, what's the damage dealer for them? Ana comboed off with Li Ming. Jaina? What's it going to be? One of the mages is very likely going to be picked now. And it's going to be a bit of a preference one. With Li Ming, you have, of course, the Calamity value and reset potential, which can make you just, like, completely hop through a teamfight. There's Johanna. And Chromie! Chromie gets played. Okay. The fake dragon is in. The little Chrome star is being played. Okay, so far so good. It's a little bit annoying for Stukov, and he tries to get some lurking arm value because he pretty much self-stuns. And then Chromie can follow that up with Dragon's Breath. That's something they have to account for now. But picks are coming. And what's it gonna be? Oh well. <laughs> Kelthas! Yes! Kelthas and Genji! Crystal Gaming! Yeah, they're going for it again. That's exactly what we're talking about. Those are these curve curveballs that the guys are throwing. Misha, of course, another target for the living bomb here. Definitely true. And, well, let's go. Let's make it happen. Last pick. What is Gorider going to take? Ah, oh, I love it. Sylvanas! Alright, ladies and gentlemen. Map number four. Potentially the last one in the series. Depends on Paper My Lady a little bit. Let's see if we get a fifth map. Or if Paper My Lady closes the series out on Volsk IF100. Game on! Volskaya Foundry! The will queue for the Polish team on Johanna. Sasabos on Chromie. We currently have Dyla on Anna. Gore Rider on Sylvanas. And Richu is playing Rexa. Akolios is Simon Kalthar. So Crystal Gaming is actually getting the Fire Mage into the action. I kind of expected Cro uh, sorry, Jaina or Liming taken, which would have been the traditional picks here, but they go for Kalthas. We have Ixi on Stukov, be on ETC, Yasu on Genji, and Slade is playing Thrall right here. And also going into the Trolling Thunder. Talent has actually been buffed by Blizzard a little bit in the last patch now. So it's actually starting to get pretty nice here. A little bit more sustain that you have. And the easy heals, the extra bounce, of course, on the chain lightning with Misha in the mix. That is also going to give you a bit more pressure and damage. But yeah, so we're going to see that talent a little bit more. We've actually seen it, I think, on the first play day, already played once. No, actually, I, was, I think it was yesterday. It was still after the patch, of, obviously. But yeah, Trolling Thunder is starting to become a bit of an option here. With the setup that they have, I didn't really expect Trash Lightning to be taken. That would have been a big surprise, considering that Thrall will spend a lot of time at the solo lane. Genji already dying, uh, diving in deep. And says the boss is low too. So both of them have lost a lot of HP with this setup. It, it's uh, going to be an aggressive game. It is the last chance for Crystal Gaming to uh, come back into this and force map 5. And I've been talking a lot about Pepe My Lady. But just picture this for a second from the perspective of Crystal Gaming. Crystal Gaming has pretty much won nearly all the series that they've played in the past against Pepe My Lady. Most of them dominant fashion. They've had a pretty good start into Division S. And obviously were hailed as one of the teams that could make a big difference in the standings here. Then they continue into the second play, they into this match. And they dominate the first map and all of a sudden they get rolled on map 2 and 3. 
Uh, there's also now the item taken away and immediately being dropped, so the fight is there, but the blue team is trapped a little bit from two sides. And Richu is about to go down. That's the kill against Rek'Sai. DC dies on the other side. They slide in from Genji as he looks for the second kill, but he dies too, so does Chromie. What a monstrous battle! Three dead against two. Five heroes died. <laughs> Six heroes down! What a fight! The earlier camp that was taken on the left side for the first turret won them a lot here. They could drop the first turret in the fight, grab the second, drop it to four, six heroes down, and it's... <laughs> I mean, it's a bloodbath. Absolute bloodbath. Four kills against two, and already a one-level lead for the blue team. Pay my lady. Impressive. Very, very impressive, I gotta say. So, uh, towards the bottom of the map. Already starting to make their jump onto Slade. I mean, trying a little bit with Misha, of course, to take him down here. With the Rolling Thunder, on the other hand, it's gonna be a bit tricky. There is self-sustain that she has with that. Yeah, there's a slide. Oh my god, Richu! You little boss there. Juke City, ladies and gentlemen. Inhabitants 1. Nicely done here. Totally juking the power slide and that very likely saved his life here. Nicely done. Okay, top side. There's already a little bit of value from Kel'Thas. Netherwind, traditional talent pick on level 4. Mana Addict is in. We have the Spine Launcher, by the way, for Stukov. So he's now more on the ranged side. The early level 7 gives a big boost to Pepe My Lady, which they now try and use to get the healing beacon on top of angling for the first objective. Yeah, they're trying to get it all. And with a level 7 talent, they could definitely take this fight now, especially since we are seeing now Rexa rotating in to help out here too. Healing Beacon is claimed. It was made a little bit more difficult by Crystal Gaming. And of course, some points on the progress bar have now ticked up, but they take position again. It's a shitty spot for Crystal Gaming. It really is. They need to now slowly start to get back into this game and establish a stable position, which they need level 7 for. Now they have that. Okay. Ooh, a Sunfire Enchantment. Interesting. Okay. Did not see that one coming. Alright. So with Sunfire Enchantment, Hammer on, plus the Ancestral Wrath now. Additional talent for Thrall yet. A lot of sustain for him, of course, now too. And they take over the checkpoint for the time being. Of course, Chromie already has a level 10 in. The Temporal Loop. And yeah, Will Q hasn't committed to the healing beacon just yet. Misha attacked, Misha locked down, Misha dead. Unbearable situation for the red team. Uh, but oh, <laughs> Will Q, he's eating a lot of damage here. He needs to be careful. Even with Ana just going for one dart after another, he needs to be cautious. He's the one having access to the healing item. So if they lose that, that would be a little disaster. But there's, of course, more camps up and another turret about to be taken, so they're going straight in for this one. Okay, Go Rider tries to lock that in. On the right side, we see the same play being made by Crystal Gaming. First Protector is going to get a lot set up here. Especially since if the blue team takes the First Protector, they're going to get level 10 with it. That would be really, really bad for Crystal Gaming. Level 10 abilities on the opponent plus the Protector, that would be an absolute nightmare and a disaster. And honestly, if this entire fight is being prolonged even more, then it might even lead us to a point where level 10 is going to side the battle for protector number one. What a setup here! Daylight Sessibus, both of them destroyed. Holy shit. And that closes the experience gap. But the fight isn't over yet. They need a counter kill, and I don't think they're going to get it. The will queue is on the run, and he's dead too. What a kill. Fantastic setup by Kolios. I mean, that was the dream right there. He gets the perfect setup in, and then they capitalize with their combo and destroy the blue team. Nicely done. Five kills against four all of a sudden, and that one move just turned the entire game. It turns the entire game. Up to that point, big leading experience for Paper My Lady. Could have gotten the level 10 ability, and now they instantly lose three. I mean, instantly. Fantastic setup. Pyroblast is in. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, Pyroblast is against this setup. I mean, Chromium most likely going to go for the timeout. You have the D on uh, Johanna, so you're most likely going to try and hit some of the other heroes here. Kind of interesting to not see Phoenix, but let's see if Corleos gets some value with that. He has a pretty much out there build, as we've already said. I mean, on level 7, he went into the Sunfire Enchantment, which in and of itself is already kind of really out there. 
But now Pyroblast on top of that too. Not well, that you get much value out of that, but let's see if we can actually make it happen. The gravity laps that he executed on the last fight definitely won them the game and brought them back to business. Now they have even the lead in kills. Set up against Genji, and yep, he wasn't protected. So Genji goes down, and they're looking for the additional kill. But first of all, of course, they're trying to take down that protector. They've still lost the fountain over here. But the Genji kill was a good one. It could maybe lead to them getting a bit more as Slade at the bot lane still holding onto their turret is pushing a few more minions into the wave. Nobody's soaking that experience just yet. But here we go. With Genji still down, they're actually trying to make that play here. And the red team seems to be willing to fight for it at least a little bit. Genji is back, but I don't think they can wait for him. But they're trying to. They're going in already. And here we go. Mosh pit, baby. And what a mosh pit it is. There's the kill against Misha. Immediately the earthquake from Thrall. And they're following it up with the kill against ETC, aren't they? Yes, ETC is down. Genji is here. There's the pyro blast. It's not going to kill Ana. Not going to do anything against her. The timeout on Chromie is keeping her alive. But with Rexa and Johanna already fallen, this is still a big loss. They at least get a counter kill against Genji, but that's about it. Pyroblast didn't really do anything. Didn't stop Ana in the slightest. She was still on full HP. Didn't even run away from it. Just simply stutter stepped her healing darts there. But of course, losing two heroes, losing the entire frontline pretty much put a pin into that fight. Even with the counter kill against Genji, they are suffering here and they're suffering a lot. And now we also have 20 stacks on Kel'Thas for his level 1, so he has the shield ready. This is rough. Very, very rough for the blue team, given the start that they had. Very even in at least kills and experience, but of course, this is going to center around the second objective at the top lane. And with the fort and the fountain down, there is a significant advantage in the hands of Crystal Gaming. And they have a fair amount of items now that they can utilize there too. The level 13 ready for both of the teams at roughly the same time. That's where the viral and reaction kicks in. And he's instantly being used. Instantly used to lock down Rexa. But they actually save him and they take ETC down. They're flanked from the will queue as he's trying to come in and they get a triple kill. What is this series? Seriously, what's happening in this series? <laughs> Kill after kill after kill. This reminds me so much of Dragonshire. <laughs> and they're not stopping! Chromie hammers the salami boy into the ground. Mr. Asha Lanore is dead. And that's the end of the fort, isn't it? <laughs> Just as it seems like Crystal Gaming is taking control of the game. We have Pepe My Lady coming back. Demolishing the bot lane, which prepares for objective number three, of course. And they are rotating the lanes instantly towards the middle. It is such an insane series. Absolutely crazy. Nicely done here. 28,000 damage now on Kalthas. 30,000 for Sylvanas. Sylv, the only hero that hasn't died in this game yet. And the fight at the top lane with a big stats advantage now for Pepe My Lady. No level lead. Uh, sorry, no talent lead though. And they still don't have the top fountain, which is of course a bit of a problem there for them. But holy hell, what a game! Okay, so let's see what's happening with Objective 2. There is still an advantage for Crystal Gaming. Let's not forget about this. 16 talents would change it. So if he can soak a little bit more in the middle, bot lane is too far pushed out, nobody is going to make a move there from the blue team. They would have to go out way too deep for that, but half level is definitely soakable. There's on the other hand the fight set up, and Thrall is dead. The mosh pit on the other hand. Mosh pit is in, ETC is down, Chromie says thank you, Ana dies too, so does Genji. What an absolute beatdown. All of a sudden, Paper My Lady looks like a different team. If you compare their performance in game number one to what we're witnessing here, it is night and day. Totally different. Yep, there was an attempt to go for Pyroblast against Gore Rider, but he jumped out of range with his wave. Kalthas, therefore, couldn't get anything done, and now he's still sitting on the slow cooldown. This is disastrous for uh, Crystal Gaming. Then again, we had a similar situation earlier in the first objective phase, and what happened was one good setup from a Gravity Labs from Kalthas led instantly to kills from Crystal Gaming that equalized the situation again. So that's definitely still possible, but they need level 16 and they need it quickly, which is why Thrall is now a soaking experience at the bottom of the map, and they're trying their best to also at least catch some items that they can use to fight for objective number two at the top side. 16 talents are going to be in play. 
There's already some pressure against that fountain, though. If they can drop that, that would be the dream. You need to take that down if you want to eliminate your advantage your opponent or currently holds over you. So they do exactly that. Open up the wall a bit as well. Kalthas with Ignite now. Went into the Pyromania, going level 13 and Ignite. Yeah, and the build is a little bit all over the place. Not what you typically see when Kalthas is played on Division S level. 14 to 9. And the approach to the top. Misha's the only one holding the spot there. And they're trying to lock her down. And Misha is dropped. But there's the... Pre <laughs> they get it. They actually get it. But they have to claim it. <laughs> it just drops down. And is at 50% HP. That was a really interesting setup. Don't see that all that often. Nice move from Bill Q. Great blessed shield. They kill against Thrall. Oh. <laughs> Oh, and ETC gets absolutely wrecked. They're trying to escape, but they're getting beat. They're taken apart here. That's three heroes down, and of course, also the end of the fort. But they were able to do a lot of damage to the Protector itself. But of course, what do you traditionally do with the Protector? You move to the bot lane and try for, to prepare for objective number three. What did they already do previously? They destroyed the bot lane. There is no keep there. Sorry, no fort there anymore. So now with level 18 against 16, they actually try and get some damage onto the keep itself. And with 8 seconds on Thor, they might be able to take this one. Misha is zoning at the front, and as you can already tell, that keep is going to fall one way or another, even if it just dies to Chromie poking from afar. Keep down, and what an advantage now for Pippi, my lady. Bot lane under their control thanks to the destruction of the four. Top keep eliminated. Catapult pressure therefore through the third objective phase. Far away from the next uh, checkpoint. And they're looking fantastic here. They can get more kills that would be even better. But I am so impressed by Paper My Lady. And Crystal Gaming is getting a little bit of a reality check here. Ah, quick blessed shield to cover the retreat. They have all the time in the world. They know that it doesn't matter that Johanna doesn't have the uh, heroic ability for a minute. The bottom objective is not going to spawn in that time frame. And they need 20. They want 20. Items get stolen away. The only thing that Crystal Gaming can do is be aggressive. Try and force a fight that Paper My Lady doesn't want them to have. A bit of an attempt here. I'm not quite sure if that's going to be successful. They might have to walk away from this one. And indeed they do. Again, the blue team doesn't want to fight. They're so far ahead. If they take a fight on even talents, they don't really want to do that. Unless they have a good opening for it. In an ideal world, they would wait until they have level 20. But of course, do you want to give that up? All right, there's the attack. And Pyro plus Genji equals death. Two down. Yes, too aggressive from Paper My Lady. They should have let it go. Now a third hero goes down. They get the counter kill against ETC. That's at least something. But of course, that closes the gap in experience a little bit. A three for one trade and more momentum for Crystal Gaming as they are trying to fight their way back into this game. Paper My Lady, they could have let it go. Now they have level 20, but their opponent is only a single level away. So that massive leading experience that they previously held is not there anymore. But there's the level 20 talents. Indestructible for Johanna. We're also having them with the Piercing Sands, Nano Infusion. Objective hasn't been announced yet, so it's going to be fine around that, but it's going to be 20 versus 20. The big advantage still is the top lane pressure. Yeah, if they can take that camp, for example, later on, that would be great. Minute and a half, on the other hand, on the timer. So that has to be taken into consideration. Kill Commander for Rexa. And yeah, Red Team is going to get that 20. It's going to be even fight. Everybody back on the map. And in we go. Ah, it was a big lead for Paper My Lady, but now it's pretty much gone. It's not quite true. I mean, it's not really gone. You still have the advantage at the bot lane where you hold on to your own gate, the fort, the fountain. That's a big thing. Then you have the top lane pressure. But of course, that camp is pretty much upsetting all of that. And they don't send anyone topside just now. So a little bit of pressure here in the middle. I'm not quite sure if they actually invest the time to go all the way top in order to make a play. But it seems like that's exactly what they're going to do. Okay. So there's going to be an early lead for the red team. Both teams now with 20. And in comes the attack right there. Quest is also completed for Rexa, which is kind of important. So he has the extra armor now, and so does Misha. There's the flamethrower. The bio explosion switch. Johanna is trying to get the wave clear. Like again, they, they let the opponent take an advantage here because they want to set up some top lane pressure. Through catapults that will eventually threaten the core. That's the play here. They're getting pretty deep for this. Damn, they're really forcing them back. They're pretty much saying, boys, if you don't do anything, if you don't go back, we are going to go core. 
That is an insanely ballsy play. Four heroes already making that happen. In they go. There's two only that have channeled back though. The other have cancelled. And they're going for the keep. They simply dive onto the keep in the mid lane. They are willing to let the protector go. They're letting the protector go. Or are they? 93 points now. There's the fight. This is a weird one. And they go for ETC. And the blessed shield seals the deal. Chromie about to go down, but the timeout. Genji in trouble. Healing beacon on the ground. They're trying to go for Chromie. She's dead. And there comes Genji again with a kill attempt against Sylvanas. And he actually does not get the kill. But the pyroblast. Yeah, that's value right there. If she doesn't have iron skin, she's dead. Oh, iron skin is in. But it doesn't matter. What a throw. Oh my god. Johanna down. Four heroes eliminated. More momentum. Anna is about to fall. And Crystal Gaming is just cleaning house. They take the kill. And now they're making their way to the top lane to get the keep here. Ah. What a throw. Big, big lead for Pepe, my lady. Then they take a fight over a healing beacon that they didn't necessarily need. They lose three heroes in the process. The experience gap gets closed around the objective. 20 versus 20. And then for some reason, even with a fountain advantage, Pepe, my lady, is unwilling to fight for the protector. Now it gets taken by the red team. They already go through the keep at the top side. Pepe, my lady, was so far ahead. And at this point, I mean... Crystal Gaming has all the tools that they need in order to get ahead here. The keep is down. Top pressure equalized. Protector moving into the middle. And this is starting to be rough. They want to go for core with this, don't they? Yeah, yeah. They gather all up at the top. But what a setup. Damn. Yeah, that's rough. That's definitely rough. This is a, this is a huge problem for Pepe My Lady here. That should have gone way different. I mean, game isn't over yet. Don't get me wrong. If they get some kills here around the protector, they can definitely still defend this. But it's going to be tricky, and they know that too. Kelthos has 70,000 damage right now. Chrome is firing away as much as she can and gets one hit in after another. That's really good damage now as well. But the core gets attacked. Can they end? That's the question. Uh, Johanna's trying their best to go into the back line. The Protector's nearly down, though. Protector is nearly eliminated. Guys, this might still not be game. Down goes ETC. There's a Salami move, and she jumps into it and dies. Oh my god, Sylvanas. What was that? She could have easily eaten that, but she actually dies to that. Kelthas is about to fall. He's nearly down. Thrall is dead. Kelthas also 20-15%. Nine. Genji and the end. Game number five coming up in this series as Crystal Gaming forces the final map of the best of five. Map five. Who would have thought? I didn't. After the fourth map, pretty heavily swung into the direction of Paper My Lady. I was pretty much convinced they would seal it with a 3-1. But then, the fateful fight over the healing beacon camp started. And yeah, then a little bit of decision making in the late game didn't really help their cause either when they decided to go to the top lane. I honestly still don't understand why. After you clear the top lane and you get pressure through the catapults there, the rotation to the bottom should have still have happened. They had a fountain there, they had the fort there, they had a much better position on that bot lane if they went into a fight. So it was kind of weird. Uh, that's a huge problem. So, again, Tomb of the Spider Queen is the last map, so this is actually where we're going to see how things are going to go for the two teams and which one is going to take the match itself. Mayev gets banned out after map one. Paper My Lady just said, okay, Mayev is just a hero. We're not going to deal with in this series, period. And therefore, insta ban against her. But Crystal Gaming, they saved, they saved their asses a little bit. Well, Sky Foundry didn't look good, not gonna lie. Deathwing gets banned out. That doesn't come as a shock. But what else? Tomb of Spider Queen is of course like a really different map to everything that we've seen now too. I mean, it's one of the smaller maps, one of the smallest. It is the smallest in the map pool, especially when we talk, when we talk about three lane maps. And those rotations between the lanes are going to be 
probably very hectic and very aggressive considering that we had already strong rotations on all of the three lane maps that we had in this series so far. That's why Lucio also gets banned out, so one of the reasons immediately, since he of course speeds up those rotations and Ixir is great on the heroes, so they don't really want to deal with that. But yeah, last ban. I mean, you could even ban out Johanna at this point. If you want to deny the wave clear hero to the opponent and that she's one of the best tanks in that role because of Condemn, then you could do that. But I'm actually a bit excited for this because I'm still expecting Crystal Gaming to have something up their sleeves where they are just zoning it out. ETC has been played throughout the series with higher priorities, so once again gets banned. That leaves Johanna up if you want to go into her as a first pick, though. That's always the big question. I mean, there's so much that you can actually do at this point. We are still talking about potentially picking Aureal here for setups that they could run. Then you have, of course, also Rexa, which is often ta uh, times taken at the bot lane. But what's the opening here for them? Is Again, even support side we go. It's Johanna. Okay, so they go for Johanna. They have the wave clear. I could have seen a ban against her. It's not quite what we see. But next pick comes up. That's now the double phase. Now... Again, a lot of choices to be made. If you want to go into the Vala setup, for example, with Aureal, you could do that. This would be a much better map for that multi-shot build that we've seen on Battlefield of Eternity from Crystal Gaming. But they go Ana, so very likely a mage pairing with her. And Junkrat! I actually didn't see Junkrat a lot in this series. We haven't seen him once. It's a bit surprising if you consider how much the hero gets focused on by other teams. If they get a good stun... I mean... A Anna's sleeping dart alone is already good setup for him to just like boop a target back into the team, but an additional stun wouldn't hurt either. With the wave clear already in for Pepe My Lady, I mean you want some more than that, but what are they gonna follow that up with? Support side, they still can take the pick here. Malfurion and Blaze. This, this Johanna and Blaze setup is something that especially Washed Up has done a lot in the past. They sometimes even first pick the two whenever they could. Now Malfurion gets follow up with that as well. That is a Really solid frontline. Very solid frontline for them. Johanna plus Blaze. Also great wave clear, of course. Malfurion for additional CC. That's a good start into this. And there's the Sylvanas ban. Okay. Uh, what else do we have? I mean, what do you ban out against Crystal Gaming at this point? Honestly, I really don't feel that you should necessarily target ban something, but more so think about, okay, what are we worried about? What do we think is a good setup against our composition? Depends a bit also on which damage dealers they want to play. They can deny an Ana combo, so either Li Ming or Jaina would probably fit. <laughs> Leo? I mean, Leo has the wave clear here, but that's still an interesting ban. I thought they would try and get rid of one of the mages that can combo with Ana the best. Problematic is that there's, of course, a lot of mages that would fit the bill on two of the Spider Queen, even some of those that we haven't seen yet. And given that they played already Kelthas on the last map, whereas this is, like, even a better Kelthas map, it's probably not really helping to ban any of those boys out. Ah, oh, Malthael in, which means that we're now probably going to see a nano-boosted Malthael. Diablo on top of that. And they still need a bit of range damage. Okay, fair. And, well, let's go. Last two picks. What's it going to be? Come on. And Jimmy Mephisto. <laughs> Did not see that coming. Did not see Mephisto coming as a pick for Go Rider here. Okay. That's usually a mucker pick, if anything. But in we go. And the last pick, it's a final map. It's a full best of five series. Beautiful. That's what we want to see. And it is. I mean, they need more damage. I kind of like what Paper My Lady has. Ah, Greymane. Alright, let's see if our boy can make it happen. Greymane in! The final setup, ladies and gentlemen, the last map in the best of five, Tomb of the Spider Queen between Paper My Lady and Crystal Gaming. Game on! Ladies and gentlemen, game number five, the conclusion! Ritual on Blaze, we have Sessabos on Reyna, the Will Q on Johanna, Dylan Malfurion, and Gorider on Mephisto. 
Whatever I expected, I did not expect map 5 out of this series. Crystal Gaming with Nokolios on Junkrat, Ixi on Ana, Slade on Malthale. We currently have Yazu on Greymane and Skewobi on Diablo. Okay, this is going to be pretty fantastic. I, li I mean, I like a lot the BF Game 5. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that Paper My Lady is not a fan of the situation since they had an opportunity to close this out with a 3-1 victory, which would have been fantastic for them. And yeah, this could be it. So off we go with, first of all, the Sleep Dart build again for Ana. Jojo already going into Hold Your Ground on level 1. And for, I mean, this might actually be the first time that the brawl in the mid lane does not end up with a kill in favor of the... Oh, actually. Kill maybe at the bot lane? Nah, not quite. Yeah. So far, most of those brawls have ended up early on with a kill lead for Crystal Gaming. Not so this time. I love this skin, by the way, for Mephisto. This is honestly one of the better skins out of that setup. So this is a pretty cool one. Bot lane is aggressively being pushed by Greymane and by Malthael. And camps are being taken left side. Which actually means that Greymane is going to make the move for the siege camp. Especially since they know that two heroes are missing. They obviously know there's only one spot pretty much where they could be. So they have all the freedom in the world to take the camp down here. We even have Richu just trying to make sure that he is anchoring the play in case that someone rotates in to slow them down. Oh, actually, sorry, it's on your opponent's team side. <laughs> Brain fart confirmed. My bad. Apologies. They're jumping in to get the kill. And they're grabbing it, aren't they? Graven might escape. There's the rest of the team coming in. They have the Siege Shine camp, though. Malfjord is on the run. And Johanna is getting away, too. All right, in we go. <laughs> I can't believe I just thought the entire time they're on the same team. Oh my god, apparently I'm going colorblind here. <laughs> I really thought he was anchoring the play and then all of a sudden he jet propulsions in and I'm just like, he really wants to make sure that they get the camp and I'm like, wait a second, he's attacking you? What's going on here? Yeah, sorry for that. Uh, Dylight goes down anyways. First, First blood. blood is in. Yes, Malfurion is down and will queue. He's able to escape. So yeah, the two camps in the mid lane are fighting against each other. This is a great setup, by the way, for Crystal Gaming. They just have the two towers helping with the defense, and then their own camp pushes through. Bot lane, those siege giants ending up in the hands of Paper My Lady is, of course, slightly annoying for Crystal Gaming. But yeah, nicely done there. Okay, so towards the top side now. Skewobi and Corleos are pushing another wave in, which means there's some experience that's going to be lost for Pepe My Lady. And yeah, slowly and steadily, a small advantage crystallizes itself for the red team. Camp is defeated. Tower's a little bit low. Of course, the displacement that we are seeing through Junkrat is always a threat, and they need to be careful with it. Go all right, and he goes down, but it's Ana that dies! And that is Pepe My Lady just saying, hey boys, we're here too. We're here to fight and not just simply to roll over and lose this game. Turn in attempts, but there's the rotation from Blaze towards the bottom to not only soak the lane, but also prevent Slade from rotating in. Then again, Junkrat is dead, and Pepe My Lady with the kills. Gems lost, yes! Skevo B doesn't get them. Gems lost, big lead now all of a sudden for Pepe My Lady, given this. But okay, in we go. Up towards the top, what else do we have? Uh, Richu, Dyla, and the Will Q are already turning in, and that is the last, or those are the last few gems that they need, and therefore the Web Weavers are coming down for the blue team. All right, it's time to see if with that level 7, they might be able to even use that tiny window that they have before the opponent grabs the next talent. Already, the blessed momentum is in. Sleeping darts are still coming through. Unstable compound now, of course. And in we go. Level 7 on both sides, and Web Weavers down to business. There we have it. Yeah, in we go, and that is already a tower down. They try to break through the wall. Fountain would be the next goal, but if they can take the entire fort, that would, of course, be the dream. They're trying to get a little bit more action going as Blaze is going for the jet propulsion, but that doesn't connect either. Yasu is still alive and dancing around them, weaving in those auto attacks as he stutter steps his way out of safety and out of Anna's grasp and straight into a four-man that happily takes him down. Raymane eliminated, the big bad wolf down. And so we'll see this fort fall too. Great start. 
Paper My Lady is off to a fantastic start here. Uh, Johanna might have a problem. Well, Fiorin is trying to help out again, gets the heal in, so not even that is uh, an issue. But that's a half-level lead, a little bit more than that. That's a fort already down in the early stages of the game. And I think the blue team is incredibly happy with this situation. Very, very happy with it. Especially since they're now also starting to move in again to take another Siege Shine camp at the bottom. That could theoretically help them to break through the wall a bit. And the blue team doesn't even have enough gems. Yeah, they just come one second too late. But they wouldn't want to take that fight anyways against that setup. Greyman wants to take it down immediately, so you just trade time there. Level 10 would, of course, be fantastic. If they get an early level 10, they could deny the turn in to Crystal Gaming and maybe secure a second one for themselves. They don't have enough gems yet, obviously. They're looking at 32. But if we're honest about it, the red team doesn't have a lot either. And the red team is now will have to wait quite some time because level 10 is around the corner. Yeah, there's the turn in attempt. They need to interrupt this now. Oh, where's the flashlight? Sleep dart value. Four stacks missing. Four missing, but here's the level 10 abilities. And how many gems do stay do they still need? Ah, well, they need another 20, so they might not be able to get that second web weaver wave after all during the time they run the heroic talent advantage, so that's a problem. Uh, but in we go. Go right as there. Big push towards the camp. Wow, that's a heavy invade. That's maybe a little bit too far out there. Uh, getting very aggressive around this. 10 is nearly there. This is a big fight, guys. Uh, but all the tools are used, and they actually go for an aggressive play, but they make it work just barely. They have double camp in the middle. You can even see them trying to push that a little bit deeper and go through the wall at the keep. But they are also looking at nearly the correct amount of gems to get another turn in for themselves. And if there's a boss moves in, they might just lock down enough turn ins. I mean, they are incredibly close right now. Insanely close. But it's still a 10 versus 10 fight, isn't it? 15 turned in, then a good spot. But again, red team has enough. Red team wants to turn in. Malthael, oh my god, he is completely alone down here. He did not expect the three man there. Nope, he's gonna die. Gonna die for sure. Went in the top, or is he? No fucking way. No, f yeah, there we go. Jesus, if he would have got a, uh, if he would have got it out there, that would have been incredible. Went into Tom and Souls, by the way. I mean, pretty obvious. They wanted to nano boost him with Anna, which is what I already mentioned during the draft. So, therefore, you don't go last right, but you go into Tormented Souls. And if your opponent doesn't have a lot of good stuns against you, you really can rip them apart. But that's the second turn now. Paper, my lady, they are going for it. They're turning in gem after gem after gem. Down at the bottom, the double turn in now from Blaze and from Jimmy, and that's the Web Weaver wave. They're trying to at least get the kill quickly against uh, Greyman, and that doesn't happen. Malthale isn't here yet, but this is spelling trouble for Crystal Gaming. Now, it seems like for them, the late game is, of course, their biggest friend. At least we've seen that a few times. Johanna has her blessed shield in just another moment, so she may have a chance to lock someone down here. But this entire situation is starting to become incredibly dangerous for Crystal Gaming. I honestly thought that after game number one, they also felt they have such a big lead in the series. Uh, or against the opponent that they can make this an easy win, but nothing could be farther away from the truth. And I'm impressed by it. Crystal Gaming needs to try to come back into this. They started a fantastic comeback on Volskaya Foundry and were able to execute it, capitalize on the opponent's mistakes, and now they have to try and do that again. Webweaver at the bot lane is aggressively pushing. That's going to be a lot of damage for sure. Top lane defended. Blast shield and Greymane is down. Diablo with a combo as they try to go for a kill against Reyna. That doesn't happen. And they go for Dibbles once again. There's a bit of a slow, but not enough. There's the Torminate Soul, the Nano boost. And he's getting locked down. Dyla in a bit of trouble, but it seems like Malthel won't be able to get the kill here. And instead, it might actually be a kill against the aspect of death. Dead indeed. He's down, Dibbles is losing his souls, and there's a kill against Junkrat. And guys, they are starting to lose, of course, more and more gems here together with that too. They only need four to get their first Web Weaver wave, but oh boy, is that a problem now. Two level lead! Ah, they want to go for the fort, they're thinking about taking boss, and of course they should, take, they should think about all these things. It's the last fort on the map for Crystal Gaming, and it's getting easily destroyed. Now they can fall back and can go for boss if they want to. They have a talent advantage over the opponent, but instead they're starting to rotate straight up into the middle. 17 gems in the hands of Crystal Gaming. That's not a lot. They pretty much lost everything. Eight kills against one. 
<laughs> what the hell is happening here? They are taking them completely apart. Yes, now we have another attempt from the red team to get the final four gems delivered. But with level 13 talent advantages, we have, of course, Pepe, my lady, not only in position, but very eager to fight on top of that too. They have another 35 gems that they could deliver if they really wanted to, just to play the safe game here, the safe option. Should do that, honestly. Turn in as much as you possibly can. 10 have already been taken now by Blaze. The fight is there with the inevitable end now, claimed. Go for the throw it. And afterwards also the unfettered assault. The attack at the top again. Apocalypse. Not enough value. Definitely not enough. So far, Malta, here's the here it is. Torminate souls plus the nano boost. They're going straight in for it, trying to get the kills, but they can't just yet. Yazo on the other hand is in trouble. Gets moon fired into oblivion as he's trying to make the play here. Anna with one healing down after another is keeping him barely alive. Go rider on his Mephisto is also pretty low but is able to move out malfail then again he just gets murdered doesn't he slate goes down again that malfail pick doesn't really do anything for them here the third time that he died he has top damage in the game on his team but that just doesn't mean jack shit if you're not able to follow up with the kills and they just can't now they're three levels behind level 16 talent advantage goes to the blue team and they go for the boss at the top of the map. Johanna even has the freedom to just sit at the side here, show herself and try to force them off the point. Yeah, interrupt after interrupt is coming in. Greyman is sitting at the top. That's not going to do anything. Yes, quick auto attack. Doesn't even have to go for anything else. Boss is already taken. They can rotate down now. Good wall's done. Iron skin is being used. There's another interrupt. And the rest of the team is joining the fun as they're saying, you guys are not going to turn in. Forget about it. Not even one web weaver wave. It's not gonna happen. There's a lockdown. They go for Diablo. He's trying to dash out. Nice attempt. Can he actually make it? And the answer is no. 10 kills against one. Level 16 talents. Pepe, my lady, is ripping Crystal Gaming a new one in game number 5. This honestly looks like a bit of a reverse play from what we've witnessed in game number 1 where Crystal Gaming just dominated their opponent from start to finish. What a setup now. Another turn in, by the way, is possible for Pepe, my lady. It would be the third turn in in a row for them. And they're gonna grab it. The keep in the middle has already taken some damage. Up to the top, the wall has partly fallen. Camps are taken all over the map. Big talent lead. Web Weaver's taken. They need to go for some of those keeps now. They wanna do that e immediately right now. That's really the moment when you're trying to just push through, make the play, get a keep, and then dominate the map on the macro level. And especially the bot lane is pressured, uh, pressured out heavily. And considering that in the middle of the map, the wall is gone and the keeper's taking damage, all they have to do is focus on the bot lane, let the mid lane push itself, and they're going to be in a good spot. I wouldn't even push the middle. I would just straight up go down to the bottom of the map, which is what they're doing now too. They have... In the middle, a camp plus a web weaver wave. That keep is gonna fall if nobody defends. And if anybody of the red team rotates into the mid lane to defend, it's pretty much them giving up the bottom of the map. Yeah, <laughs> and that's what we're seeing. Bot lane, no chance, none. Nothing that can be done here. That, fo that keep is down. There's no question. They can rotate into the middle and see if they can maybe even grab another one. Top lane has to be defended too somehow. And even that is nearly impossible. So the first keep is already a goner. The second keep is about to fall. Level 16 talents are at least coming in for Crystal Gaming. But it might be too late to do anything about the keep here. Keep down. That's too eliminated. The fight has to be forced. And they do it right away as they have 16. But can they win it? And the answer is no. Down goes Malthael. He's eliminated. Well, Malfurion goes down. Maybe Greyman has a chance here? Nah, he falls. Greymane falls and now they're locking in Anna, don't they? Ixia is on the run. He played some fantastic games in this series, had some incredible plays, but it doesn't look like they can win this series. Pepe, my lady, what a fight. They lost to Washed Up with an 0-3 on the first playday. And now they're about to lock in a victory on playday number two. Big win for them. Important win for them. They take down the opponent's shield. The core is falling, 50% HP. They go for Junkrat. They go for the core. And this just has to be it. Pepe, my lady, with a win on the last and final map on Tomb of the Spider Queen. What an incredible performance here. What an incredible series. That was fantastic. GG and well played.